All right, good evening, everyone, and board directors. I'm going to go ahead and, and just open up our work session. Um, those of you in the audience may know that we typically meet an hour before our meeting in a work session format to discuss various topics. However, tonight, we do have issues we need to discuss in executive session, which is a closed session for purposes of receiving legal advice as allowed by CRS 246-4024B regarding the acquisition, purchase, transfer of sale of real property and regarding Tri-County Health Department's public health order in the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners actions related to its withdrawal from the Tri-County Health Department and also counsel regarding pending and or threatening litigation, including LV and LV versus DCSD. During executive sessions, the board is not allowed to adopt any proposed policy, resolution, or regulation or take any formal action. We do have a quorum of board members. Everyone is present, so I would first of all ask for a motion to adjourn our work session and move into executive session. Move to go into executive session. Second. Motion made by Graziano, seconded by Director Holtzman. Our executive session will also include Superintendent Corey Wise, General Counsel Mary Clemish, and uh, Chief Operating Officer Rich Cosgrove, as well as remote consultation from Kristen Edgar from Kaplan and Ernest. And then also for the audience uh, information, we will return at six o'clock to convene our regular board meeting. So with that, a motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, so you none, let's vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. Passes unanimously. We will now move to our executive session location.
Good Recording evening, everyone. I'm progress. calling to order. Whoops. Someone else is on. <laughs> calling to order the meeting of the Douglas County School District Board of Education for September 28th at 6.02. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm just noticing, Ms. Marsh, that um, I'm doing my own order today. Um, I thought Pledge of Allegiance should happen first, and then I see that we uh, also have roll call after student spotlight. But I always think we do roll call before student spotlight. So I'm going to take liberty and do roll call at this time. So, Chantra Shore. Here. Graziano. Here. Hansen. Here. Holtzman. Here. Lung. Here. Meek. Here. And Ray is here. All right, good evening, everyone. So next on our agenda is the student and staff spotlight. Uh, Superintendent Corey Wise. Good evening, sir. Wanna just say good evening to everybody and uh, it's a great time to look at a spotlight of the many things happening uh, here in Douglas County. Uh, quickly, as we think about our spotlights, September 15th through October 15th marks National Hispanic Heritage Month. So we really want to take a spotlight with a theme and going back to our school district. We have some amazing family and cultural liaisons who not only work with our, our schools, but work with our families. They work with a number of areas, but we're especially a focus of how we build our emerging bilingual learners. We think about it and have the opportunity of how we engage, how we support, over that PK-12 environment. So I want to start off with a quick video to, to get it going, and then we're going to honor some key people. Navigating a new school is full of obstacles. Imagine trying to figure it out when you don't understand what you're hearing. They just don't know how to communicate with our staff because, you know, it's different language. Here in Douglas County, foreign language is not limited to Spanish. Douglas County schools represent um, five major different languages. It's Spanish, Russian, um, Korean, Vietnamese, and Chinese Mandarin. La escuela signa. To help cross the barriers, families are getting to know some new family liaisons. I just started this year. Their new job is no small task. The most important thing is bring the community to the school. Claudia, the Castle Rock liaison, has been in their shoes. I came to the United States in 1999, and I have two daughters. And I remember myself uh, going to the kindergarten meetings, um, open house, siempre. Now she's hosting her own open house to welcome these emerging bilingual families. It makes a difference. Make you don't feel shy to write an email. Make you be you know, afraid to go uh, to the school because you feel welcome. They understand that they can write emails in Spanish and, and teachers are able to translate those into English. The more knowledge, the less fear. Information is power. And if you have the information, you can support more your kids and your kids will success. And you want that for your kids. Perhaps even more important than the ins and outs of technology and schedules is the feeling of connection. Just getting to know who she is, her story, and also the story of her kids. You can't understand a child's story without understanding their family background. Just how much difference can someone like Highlands Ranch liaison Noah make? Oh, bastante. It's como un ángel. She says a lot. It's like having an angel. Oh, my gosh. Makes me feel so happy. Lo que ellas hacen, when I see these people responding, coming here, makes my day better. I know that I usually go home satisfied. <laughs> satisfied knowing that more families can conquer that next obstacle. They feel like a, ah, less stress because yeah. they have enough stress in life. Gracias. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. To put a little video in perspective uh, to understand the work, we also want to just remind ourselves of you know, that work of building family, building engagement, building community. Uh, the cultural liaisons are so important in ensuring this. 
and making sure that all of our families and students are able to navigate, ask the questions, looking at a large and complex educational system to really get the support that they need. And at this time, I'd like to bring up two of our, our leaders, Becky Kaur and Remy Rummel from our Language, Culture, and Equity Department to talk more about the Family Cultural Liaison Program and to introduce Douglas County's six liaisons for recognition tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Wise. The Family and Cultural Liaison role has enriched the relationship between families and schools through connection, engagement, and partnership. We are proud to introduce our family and cultural liaisons this weekend, or this week, this evening, where are we? <laughs> um, and to celebrate and recognize their outstanding work that directly and positively impacts our students and families across the district. Rocio Alonso, Kathy Cedeno de Jesus, Marta Cisneros, Claudia Flores Johnson, Bruna Mendez, Noah Rodriguez, as well as the school personnel and your colleagues who have joined you tonight, will you please join us up here? Come on up. This team before you is incredible. When I talk about family, school, and community partnerships, I use the metaphor of a space launch so that everyone can visualize the critical role they play in launching student success. For a successful space launch, we need engineers, physicists, cheerleaders, mission control, astronauts, and um, that's just to name a few. When families, schools, and communities come together, student learning takes off. Uh, our liaisons are like the mission control of a space launch, creating bridges to connect uh, stakeholders for a common goal of student success. They are the crux and the connectors in building bridges in multiple languages. Today, um, Marta Cisneros from Southridge Elementary was the first liaison in Douglas County School District more than 15 years ago. <laughs> Today, alongside the trailblazing efforts of Southridge and Marta Cisneros, our team of three regional liaisons and three school-based liaisons work tirelessly to build strong relationships with families, educators, and communities. These partnerships are the foundation of student success. Thank you to the leaders who have supported this mission. Thank you liaisons for the, the strong communities you're building. We have countless stories of gratitude from our community, our educators, and our families. Thank you. So before you go, quickly, if I can pass the mic, if you can just share the impact of the role, the value you have, and then we have certificates for you, and we'd like to circle up with a, with a picture afterwards. Well, I want to kind of pass the mic just to share a little bit. We saw a little bit, but share a little more from your perspective of the value impact. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martha Cisneros, and um, I, first of all, I want to thank the school board for recognizing the work of the liaisons. Um, I, I feel very privileged to work for and uh, serve an incredible community at Southridge Elementary and where um, we, what we try to do is create a welcoming and warm environment and uh, everyone at our school actually um, takes pride in that. And um, I'm just uh, a section of that uh, as a resource in helping the newcomer families uh, feel welcomed, feel connected to the school, to the district, to the resources that the community has to offer and so that they can access um, all the different programming available to them uh, to make their kids successful. And uh, like Claudia mentioned in the video that we just saw, it's bringing down that stress because as a newcomer family, uh, my goodness, there's so much to deal with. And if we can't uh, provide that, um, help them feel confident 
so that they can engage properly and, and do it um, and, and feel part of the school. And uh, I am just really, um, really happy to and fortunate to be in this role. Hello, my name is Bruna Mendez. Um, thank you so much, the district, um, for this uh, recognition. I am very honored to be here. Um, our role has a great impact to our multilingual families because we help families to engage with our educators at schools and our community. Um, and all of that, this, is, this leads to academic success for our students. Uh, we welcome multilingual families, we connect, we build relationships with them to increase their involvement in our schools. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Rocio Alonso. I am the Multicultural Liaison of Castle View. Dr. Core is very generous and shared me with <laughs> Sedalia Elementary and the Middle School in Castle Rock. I think this role not only gives the, the newcomers feeling welcome, also the families we have in the past, especially at the level of high school, they were the parents start losing their role. They are coming back to be the roles and they are coming back to be visible and the kids are not the one who need to take care of everything. They need to be kids. So I think that is very important. Also, Dr. Kerr believed in me. <laughs> I don't know if that was the, the word because I arrived with a grant and a year later he decides then I need to be in the school. So thank you very much for everything. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Cedeno, and I'm the cultural liaison over at Douglas County High School. I also want to thank the district and Mr. Tony Capis for this opportunity. For me, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to give back to my community. And um, like everybody has mentioned, we are that bridge of communication between our community and the school. And uh, truly representation is a big part of this, being able to go to someone who looks like you talks like you um, really helps to alleviate some of that stress and worries that some of our families have. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Noah Rodriguez. I am the uh, family liaison for the Highlands Ranch region. Um, I just wanted to give thanks to the school board here and also for um, Remy and Becky Core as we've navigated this new role and also Francesca, thank you. Um, being a liaison is, is not an easy task. Um, you know, you see me, I am, I am come from a Hispanic background, that's my heritage, but we work with lots of cultures and, and so being a liaison is very important because we get to be that bridge between different cultures that are represented in our county. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but um, Douglas County is very diverse. And a lot of times our diverse cultures just tend to be hidden. And so this role has really allowed us to empower and give compassion to education where we can empower um, these families to be able to come out of the shadows, so to speak, and feel emboldened to participate in their child's education. And um, that's just education, I think, and that's compassion. And as a liaison and working with our multicultural families, it's empowering for not only them, but it's also empowering for us and our school staff that these families are now able to be engaged and to be able to help their families learn. Thank you. Okay. My name is Claudia. Um, I work for um, in the region of Castle Rock. Um, in my role, in our role, um, we really work with the families to provide them tools how they can navigate in the system and learn how to um, educate, like uh, provide them tools for the families so they can help the kids, the students, to be successful in the school. Um, provide them feel um, like mental health because our families. Um, like uh, they deal with a lot of stress in, um, during, they have the two jobs in a day, a lot of moms raising themselves the kids. Um, they, they probably don't have the time to check the emails, to check how to navigate the website, how to communicate with the schools. 
and we are very happy to can provide those tools for the families um, and make, make them feel welcome. Thank you very much for these awards and congratulations everybody. Good evening, everybody. I am Francesca Papalardo, and I'm the principal at Crest Hill Middle School, and I have the pleasure to work with Noah Rodriguez. Um, and I was so excited to be able to be here tonight because I do want to speak to specifically Noah. Um, when Becky called me and we were looking for a, an office space for Noah, and I said, absolutely, um, we will take him because whenever we get these amazing resources in our building, we have them at our fingertips. And so whenever we have questions or concerns, we know we can hop upstairs and Noah's going to be there. Um, and so we're really blessed to have him in the building. And from day one, he's had an impact. Um, we were get planning our back to school night and immediately he started working with our ELD department um, to how, how we can reach out to families and get them to join us um, knowing that they're not going to understand everything that's going on. And it felt like the UN. It was pretty cool because they had the, the cool headphones and um, they were able to access everything, and he was there, and our ELD department was there, and you could tell that um, they truly were that bridge for those families to feel comfortable to come in and be a part of the community. Um, he's already planning some um, other events. We have some meet and greets coming up um, so that we can continue to have that relationship with families, that it's not a, a one and done, but it's a continual partnership so that they feel comfortable um, asking questions. Um, you know, if there's attendance issues, it's always going to be more positive to have a liaison reach out than an administrator or a counselor. They feel like they're in trouble or something's wrong, and we just want to wrap around the families and, and have all the kids at school. And so um, thank you, Noah. You've been amazing um, from day one, and we're just happy to have you. So congratulations to everybody. Thank you, and I'm Jill Casas. I am the principal at Southridge Elementary and honored to work with Martha Cisneros. Um, Martha is a passionate advocate. She is a community connector, and she is an outstanding educator. Um, our community is better off because of Martha. She steps in the gap. She steps up. She communicates with our families. She translates letters for me. She calls families, and she makes sure everyone stays connected. She coordinates events. And we are so lucky to have you as a part of our team, Martha. Thank you for everything that you do. Hi, good evening. Tony Kappas, Douglas County High School. First off, Martha, thank you for all you've done. You've been the pioneer for this program, and we are deeply indebted to you, and so is the community. So thank you. And as for Kathy, you are a blessing and an angel. I cannot believe how, how you've, you've taken to the family, the DC family. And you've made so many differences in people's lives today and in the last few weeks since we've been started, and even in the spring during the COVID. I am beyond grateful for all the things that you've done for our children and for our staff. You are a true member of the Husky family. Good evening, Rex Kaur, uh, Principal of Castleview High School. Just a great deal of pride this evening as a longtime member of Douglas County School District that this is the right work, and this is the work that we're doing. And I appreciate the leadership that has gone into paving the way, and I appreciate uh, those stepping up for, for the, this level of work. Rothio Alonso is, has been a phenomenal addition to the Castleview family. She's got a sign on her desk that says hashtag hustling. And, <laughs> and she is all day, every day. She's, she's logging miles and she's logging minutes and she is, she is continually engaged with families. We know as a, as, a, as a piece of the comprehensive multi-tiered system of supports, family engagement is one of the great contributors to student success. And that's all of our families. And these roles serve as part of that infrastructure, part of that bridge. And so we are grateful for all of your work. This is the right work. Well said. To conclude, thank you. It's good to not only start to know a name, even a role or a school. Tonight, you get to see more visibly what the work is, the value, the people. People make the difference. So thank you for going above and beyond. Thank you for making the difference and continuing the work. Each and every family, each and every student matters. And I can't say enough. So let's circle up and let's have a big round of applause as we take a picture of the group.
One, two, three. We'll do one more. One, two, three. Thank you so much. And as a final closure, this concludes our, our spotlights for Douglas County, uh, not only our programmings, but some amazing people. So thank you for the opportunity. Good. All right, let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Board directors, next on our agenda is to accept the agenda. Is there a motion? I move to accept the agenda. Second. Motion made by Meek, seconded by Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Director Chancha Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray. Aye. That passes unanimously. Mr. Weiss, we're back to you to do some updates regarding academic excellence and as well as some district updates. Absolutely. I'm going to introduce our learning service officer, Matt Reynolds, to come up to the podium to start with our first uh, superintendent report. Last meeting, we had a, a great opportunity to dialogue, to dig deeper. Uh, to get ready for a process of monitoring reports. And in that, we really want to get into that work session. What does that look like? To, if you haven't seen it, I'd love to, to encourage you to go back and watch. But at the same time, Matt's really going to do a, a review, a summary piece quickly of uh, overall arching pieces, and then also set the prelude for what's coming in upcoming meetings as we continue deepening the work uh, regarding our monitoring reports and work sessions. Mr. Reynolds. Good evening, uh, Board President, uh, Board of Directors. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to recap uh, the work session that we had uh, several weeks ago. I guess it was two weeks ago um, today. Um, next slide, please. Um, on September 14th, we had a study work session where we reviewed uh, some initial data from uh, 2021, really looking at the data from um, the spring assessments that we had. Just some uh, capturing some of the highlights from uh, the evening and, and looking at the data. Overall student performance, we did see that our English language arts kept with the same trajectory that we saw before uh, the pandemic and before the uh, testing was stopped and paused in 2020. Uh, we did notice that our math scores on the flip side of that um, had a decline as compared to previous years. And we discussed some of those different uh, things that went into the work from the previous year. Um, the English language arts was really a, a huge celebration to our schools and our staff. Um, the fact that we were able to maintain that across um, and it just highlights some of the work that we have moving forward in that area. Uh, we did discuss student participation. Uh, that data set uh, across the state was an interesting data set to review uh, because you had wide variations in student participation across the entire district. Uh, one of the things for us as a, a county and a district, um, our participation rates for the first time were above the state level. Um, and there's many contributing factors to that. Uh, one was that we had students in person earlier than most of our neighboring and competitive districts. Um, but however, the other thing that we did discover is we did have local impacts of quarantines, positive COVID tests during testing. So even in our own system, we did see spots where um, our participation varied from building to building depending on what the scenario was during the testing window. Um, the highlight of the night, I would say, was the school level perspectives. Um, of bringing in several of our principals to really talk about not only the data, but most importantly, what they're doing from action steps, uh, leveraging that work for what they're doing this year in addressing student needs. Um, the other thing that we're going to look at continuing this year is to continue the conversation of data. Um, and as you all know, I, I love to talk data. So um, that's a highlight uh, of the work is being able to support that priority of looking at data throughout this year. Um, next slide, please. So a couple of things that we did discuss, but I wanted to wrap up again and just reflect on. First is the idea that uh, schools have plans in motion continuing. And you heard firsthand from our principals that work that they're doing at the school and the classroom level to address needs um, and those action steps that they're taking to address those needs. Um, another key aspect of this year um, is as a district with our focus on professional learning communities, we're really introducing that concept by um, 
really grounding ourselves in our own data from not only a district lens, but also looking at school, classroom, and individual students. That's a big, a big focus of our work, uh, particularly in the next bullet point as we talk about alignment between the board goals, the strategic plan, our priorities, um, and looking at the school plans on how we're gonna address not only the student needs, but make sure that we're in alignment with um, all three of those levels. Um, the last part that we did talk about was uh, looking at schools and setting their own individual benchmarks. Um, as you may recall, you know, we have variations within our school level performance. And so making sure that those schools are able to set targets that are specific to their student populations and their student needs. Um, all the while, we want to be able to celebrate our successes, but look for opportunities to address challenges. Um, and that's a really a recurring theme is to not make sure that, you know, we have an opportunity to not only talk about the highlights, but also talk about what we need to work on for this year. Um, looking forward in time, um, in terms of our study work sessions, um, as we move throughout the year, we're going to be talking about data sets really as they become available. Um, so we have growth data. Uh, the state just released its latest visual for that growth, so that's something that we'll be talking at a, at a future work session. Um, we do have graduation, dropout, matriculation data. That will come out at a future date. Um, and as those data sets come in, we'll, we'll be able to, to sit down and actually talk about what that impact is as the state makes those available. Um, at our next work session, and, and I believe our superintendent's gonna get into some detail on this as well, on October 12th, we are gonna dive into social emotional learning. Uh, that will be a, a big focus of, of that work. Um, how it connects to the Colorado academic standards, what our work is in these areas, and really have a, a nice dialogue uh, where we can discuss and have questions answered and raised all in that same seating. So with that, I'm going to take a breath and just see if there's any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. And I would tell you, you missed one data point that I think we were pretty excited about. Do you know what data point that is? Um, I'm at a loss here. Re graduation rate. Can you talk about graduation rate? Yeah, so the graduation from 2020, um, that was, we're at 91.2, is, is one of the highest in the area. Um, and that's a data set that we're looking to see when the next official one comes out in January uh, to continue to celebrate that success. Um, you know, it's pretty remarkable in, in the, this day and age of, of COVID and all of the challenges of maintaining that high level. So we're, we're very, very excited about that and look forward to the next round of data. Very good, thank you. I wanted to highlight that it, as well because it's really a reflection of everyone. It's, it's a reflection of the folks that stood before us that are helping welcome those students in to our culture. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a reflection of our teachers starting from preschool on up. Um, I just think we need to celebrate that um, that high percentage is, is not easily attainable without parent support, without teacher support, and I think we need to really uh, hang on the rafters and celebrate that. So just thank you for reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Directors, are there questions or anything else you want to ask Mr. Reynolds? Director Lung? Well, I also want to highlight another data point besides we have the highest graduation rate in the Metro Denver is our SAT score and the PSAT 10 and PSAT 9. During two weeks ago, when we have the work sections, I believe, which we did not show in here, is we are still the second best among the Metro Denver area, even though during the COVID years. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, last year uh, was an interesting year, as uh, we've all seen. Uh, we had the opportunity to administer SAT twice, uh, once in the fall and once in the spring. Our fall time administration was something to make up for the pausing of assessments to 2020. Um, that year, we had our 12th grade, 12th grade students take it. Um, you know, that mean scale score was the highest that we've seen in Douglas County uh, for that particular group of students. We also administered in the, in the springtime with our 11th graders. Um, so we had two opportunities to really look at our data from this last year. And uh, again, it's really a celebration of the work that happens um, each and every day by our students. And so we were very, very happy with that data. Directors, any other questions or comments from our study session? It was really, truly well done. 
Mr. Reynolds, we learned a lot and appreciate the opportunity to go in depth with student, student learning. Um, you know, uh, Lucas Gauthier is here, and I'm not gonna call you up yet, but Lucas is going to be doing our student comment tonight. And Lucas, just as a pre, if you'll make a mental note to maybe mention some of the discussion our students had about the math scores. They had some really interesting insights. Um, and certainly, as you've said, Mr. Reynolds, we want to pay attention to the areas for growth just as much as celebrating the things that we've seen, uh, areas of progress that we've seen. Um, but I think it's also interesting and, and important to note that that trend in math it mirrors the trend nationally and in the state is what you presented. But I'm, I'm also looking forward for you to hear from Lucas tonight because uh, they just kind of had this nice little conversation amongst our student advisor group about some thoughts they had about maybe why that, uh, those scores are, are different than our language arts scores. So we'll, we'll, we'll hold that until uh, Mr. Gauthier comes up a little bit later. Director Long, did you have a further comment? Yes, um, when we talk about academic achievement, that is more than a CMAS scores or SAT score. I was very impressed by uh, Deputy Superintendent Andy Eller. I asked him the questions two weeks ago and I would love him to uh, say it again in the open board meeting, how we should measure our students' academic achievement beyond what we see in CMAS um, or SAT score, because we have a lot more students besides graduation rate to prove that we are the one of the best, but also the CT program, the, um, the character tech education program that we provide, and but I, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> this is Deputy Superintendent. Andy Abner, Deputy Andy Superintendent, Abner. thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Director Lung. I'll do my best to recall what we talked about, but for a long time, I've believed that the greatest measure of success of our school district is how well our graduates are doing, how successful they are post-graduate once they leave us. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that we can look at that. Um, but the one thing that I've always been very impressed with is our school district does a tremendous job of preparing every student for their own level of success. And so whether you're talking about career and technical education, the concurrent enrollment courses, the different things that, that line up to a successful graduate, you know, a college preparation, all of those things, it's been my experience, and I continue to run into alumni all the time, folks that are very proud to share that they've graduated from a Douglas County school who are doing remarkably well. And so I think that that's the true measure of how well we're doing as a school district. You can look at test scores, you can look at the, the individual scores of all of the different students. You can, you can compile that into a school, kind of a rating if you will, and, and there's many people that do that across the Denver metro area. But we're really missing the point if we're not taking a look at how well our graduates are doing. I think each and every one of us can probably look inward and see areas that when we were in high school, maybe we didn't do as well in certain areas as we thought we might. But overall, hopefully we turned out successful. Hopefully we got the skills and the necessary um, learning and achievement that we needed to be successful in our next steps. So I think it's important to pay attention to our graduates. And I'm not sure if that's what you were specifically asking me. You're welcome to dig in further, but. That's, that's what I remember as the comment from our work session. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hebner. Director yeah. Chancho, thank you, Mr. Hebner. Director Chancho, sure. You knew you weren't going to get away without me saying something, Matt, but I wanted to um, address slide three where it says school PLC data and action next steps. PLCs refers to professional learning communities. We have a lot of acronyms in education. That specifically, and I hope you'll tune in to look at and listen to some of what the the principals from the school. Borrow uh, Director Graziano's if you. Yeah, I'm happy to just talk. Here. It doesn't uh, broadcast. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so I hope you would tune in and check out um, what some of our pr principals said about what they are doing. And in slide three, it's very specifically talking about how we know that there's always work to do in schools. That's what schools are all about. And schools are taking the time, teachers and principals take the time when, in what's called PLCs to address how are our schools doing and what do we need to do better for all kids that are in our schools. So I wanted to address that and just kind of point out, it really was such an incredible meeting because we heard about incredible opportunities that schools are celebrating and taking the time to talk about individual students. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Chancho. Director Meek. 
since we're all talking, um, <laughs> the PLC is what stuck out for me as well. Um, I think oftentimes people don't understand what that is because it's education speak. And, you know, for, for any industry, you know, people are the lifeblood of any organization. And PLCs are professional development and training for our employees. And I was just struck by how well it was described, but also how it was described that you know, teachers and schools are focused on the individual student. And they were talking about how they go about that work. And so I thought it was a very powerful presentation. Very good, thank you, Director Meek. All right, directors, anybody else? Mr. Reynolds, again, thank you for our study session as well as capturing the highlights from that study session. And we look forward to continuing that work at our next study session. So thank you very much. Thank well, you very much. Turn it back over to Superintendent Wise for district updates. So a natural transition as we talk about that, you know, when you talk about graduation rates, we also have the highest graduation requirements. Each year we measure individual achievement and growth and schools and our district. But when you look at those snapshots, it's really the story over time, over that PK-12 experience and more. So as Mr. Abner was sharing, uh, you know, the opportunity that people have to, to get uh, industry certifications, CTE and concurrent enrollment transcript to college credits, uh, the opportunity that our students graduate from Douglas County Schools, and we were the highest last year. We also had the highest requirements. But then to see them go off prepared for the future, uh, prepared to come back as sturdy individuals, it really leads into what we're talking about for our next work session. Going into October, academic excellence as a board end and goal is a large topic. It encompasses a lot of things. So as you start looking about that readiness, uh, the being involved, being engaged, uh, having these skills, the assets to know how to cope, advocate, ask questions, be resilient, self-monitor and correct. You know, it's a, it's a function we want each of our students to have and honestly each of us to have. And so that's a part of the work that we'll be looking at into, into October to really define that. And when you look at that social emotional learning along with our mental wellness and health, I think that's a key piece that we look forward to sharing more. So as we go into uh, next slide, please, some of the highlights. Just want to throw out that Forbes, uh, best in state employer of 2021 Douglas County School District, ranked 20th out of 60 nominated for Forbes best in state employer in 2021. So we're continuing to build that, that with the board in, the safe and positive culture the ability to hire and attract and keep the best. People do matter, people make the difference. That's a great piece of acknowledgement I wanna call out on the work that's happening. And really when you say it, it's really tr trying to provide the best culture, the best time and resources to put people at their, at their very best uh, to act. Building the dream gala, gala coming out. So as we look at Apple Awards and how we recognize and spotlight a lot of what's happening both in classified, in teaching and in administration, uh, we have the building the dreams uh, gala coming up just to not only continue that partnership with our community and support, but also uh, recognize the outstanding uh, individuals throughout our district and really recognize a few of those uh, spotlighted, highlighted, and those winners again. School community and homecoming events. Over the past two weeks, we've had several, if not almost all of our homecoming starts to take place. We have a few more this week and next week. What a great opportunity for kids to be involved, to be in school, and you look at social emotional, be a part of school, not only inside the classroom walls with academics, but outside in co-curricular, extracurricular opportunities. Our leaders have created uh, not only traditions and kept those going, but also looked at creative ways to work within where we are, have homecoming dances outside, and the amount of people involved uh, within not only the events, the games, the activities within the school, the spirit competitions, but also the dances. So really pleased and appreciate the work that's happened within our schools. Uh, during this time. Our engagement opportunities. Uh, we've, uh, we've tried to reach out and build more opportunities. We want to engage, uh, not only to, to share more information, but we had a great panel and work with our safety, mental health, and social emotional work. Uh, really to start the stage and really set it up for October as we move forward with more of the, uh, the study work session, the dialogue, but then also the monitor reports, what is happening. Uh, we've worked hard uh, with our special education and they've having a number of different ways in which to dialogue informally and a little more formally. And the amount of attendance uh, has been great. Uh, we had sessions this year uh, that dyslexia parent presentation on the 22nd with over 130 attendees. 
We had SPED talks on the 23rd, and we have those twice a month, so they'll continue. So our attendance has been great. We just want to make sure people are aware and build in more opportunities. And uh, you know, last we start looking about it, uh, our student advisory group had has now had two meetings. And when you look at those two meetings, they're also taking up the opportunity uh, to want to be involved. So student advisory group has, has asked, and they are setting up uh, board of education candidate forums. And we have three that invites were sent out today by our student advisory group. Uh, Thunder Ridge High School will be hosting one uh, Monday, October 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. Cassidy High School, Wednesday, October 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. And Legend High School, Monday, October 25th, 6 to 8 p.m. So I just want to say thank you to Lucas, uh, your leadership, uh, along with the others, and all of the uh, uh, student advisory group uh, students and their involvement. Lastly, on the next slide, uh, we just had this past Saturday a job fair. You know, as we've talked about, the need of substitute teachers, the need of EAs, tra transportation EAs, bus drivers, a number of positions. We had a had an opportunity uh, to host that at Crest Hill Middle School for half a day, and, and you know, we're working. We had uh, several programs offer conditional offers uh, of employment. So we had over 20 people get offers, mainly for EAs, but also within transportation and custodial, and those are highly needed. So uh, we'd always want more, so we want to recruit and request more people to apply, but what a great opportunity. We'll also be a part of a uh, online uh, job recruiting piece this week and next week also to continue to reach out and try to hire some of those areas that, uh, that we're still seeking out employment, some of those hard to fill positions. So we're thinking outside of the box. We wanna look at going to hardware stores, grocery stores, suppliers, uh, to see if they can fill some of those voids that are common and look at not only the, the retainment and recruit in uh, and that center to come work for our district, but also the benefits uh, long-term. So those are the updates, questions for me. Very good, thank you, Superintendent Wise. Any questions, board directors for Superintendent regarding the updates? Very good, thank you, sir. Absolutely. And, and, and you made a great segue for our next agenda item, which is student comment. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Lucas Gauthier to the podium. Lucas is one fourth of the leadership team for our student advisory group this year. And as Superintendent Wise said, our leadership team for Student Advisory Group is incredible. And, and I, I've watched Lucas now for two meetings. We are, had our first meeting where we were at Echo Stadium and we had rain while we were out, then we ran inside, then we went back out. But I'll tell you, this young man uh, facilitated a group of 70 people like nobody's business. Um, he was able to involve them in an activity when they were inside, when they were taking shelter from the rain, and then he was able to guide them back out. And so um, our future is in good hands, ladies and gentlemen. When you watch these students in action, I know Director Lung and I both have the privilege of serving as liaisons for the student advisor group, but uh, a very impressive group. So with that, we have student comment time, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Gauthier to share with us any updates. Go ahead. Absolutely, we've had an amazing start to student advisory group, of course. It's been interesting with that first meeting having to deal with the rain, but um, the second meeting, which we just had last night at the Inverness building, was a great success, and we were really able to start drilling into the core of student advisory group and what it's about really connecting with our 70, 80 group members this year. So one of the things that I'd like to highlight um, going into our new year is our focus on our subgroups. So subgroups are what we utilize in order to help um, orient our groups towards specific projects that we will present to you at the end of the year. And of course, some of these are coming in from last year. However, we've also had a great deal of new ideas presented to us throughout the course of uh, last meeting, and I will present those. So the ones continuing from last year are school safety, diversity and equity, financial literacy, mental health, which is newly incorporating substance abuse as a focus area, um, Eco-friendly, which is now also incorporating technology as a focus area. And this is in addition to two new exploratory groups, which are looking into a um, hands-on learning methods model, as well as a policy appeals group. So we're really excited to have the opportunity for these new groups to start looking into um, the different um, opportunities that we can look through throughout the district and really provide you guys with valuable input and feedback and um, really help improve things. And then um, I believe that uh, you spoke to the uh, math discussion that we had prior, and I thought that I would comment on that. So we, we had a great discussion session, maybe um, it, we, we budgeted 15 minutes, it went for 30, but it was all good <laughs> because we had, we had a great deal of discussion. And I think that it really boiled down to three different points as to why we did see those math scores drop off. 
Um, the first being, um, when you compare it to language, math is much more, um, it's much more binary. You're either right or you're wrong, and there's much less room for interpretation. As such, it's more difficult to um, explain it in a way that allows for individual thought. It's a much more single track approach. And that's one of the unique things about math that makes it more difficult than um, English, particularly in an online learning environment. Um, in addition, there, there has been a, a it, for some people, myself included, it's very difficult to learn math online when you're not able to interact or ask those spontaneous second uh, right in the action questions that would help you get that extra piece of understanding. And in addition, in that um, onset of COVID from March through May, um, our math class did very little to no work. And as such, I feel other classes probably were in a similar position where people were left unprepared for the classes that faced them in the next year. So as such, even though people did undergo, um, may have had amazing teachers who kept them on track throughout the remote and hybrid models, it's still you still had to spend a lot of time reviewing. And that's been a knock on this year because of, um, because of the nature of math and its linear fashion. Um, and then in addition, the last thing that we identified was it's easier to cheat online. And for math in particular, it's easier to cheat. And some people will take advantage of that despite um, differing situations. But it's also um, important to recognize that um, people want to verify that they're right. And although um, in those online situations, it's easier to fall to that kind of situation. But then again, it's also important in helping to define um, the reasons why math could potentially be lower than comparable English scores. Yeah. Very well said. Is it, are you, do you see why we love this group? I mean, they're honest, they, they're insightful, they're, their wisdom is beyond measure. Um, and Mr. Reynolds, I saw Mr. Reynolds over here taking copious notes, uh, Lucas, to your anecdotal thoughts about that. But um, again, I can't emphasize enough that the student advisor group truly um, does things that are according to their passions. So whether it's mental health or eco-friendly or, or financial literacy, these are things that our students feel uh, are important to them. And so that's why it's just so incredible to, to have them have this tight connection with the board because it really does inform our work. Any questions uh, for Lucas before we let him uh, sit back down? All right, Director Graziano. Thanks for that report. I, I just have a question for you. You mentioned as one of your subgroups, financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about more about what the group's interest is in, in that and what sparked it? Absolutely. So I believe that financial literacy is one of those subgroups that we are carrying over from last year. Um, it, as a subgroup, has posed interest in potentially integrating a new class into curriculum that allows for students to gain a better understanding of financial literacy. And short of that, potentially integrating um, pieces, elements of financial literacy into homeroom that would help um, juniors and seniors in particular gain comprehension into things like personal finance as well as things that will be relevant as they begin that transition into college. Very good. Thank you, Lucas. Director Lung? Well, again, thank you very much. I'm so proud, along with uh, President Ray, to be one of your two board liaisons for the Student Advisory Committee. And um, we are the only metro Denver area that has a Student Advisory Committee under the board, which this board passed in 2018 to show how much we treasure the students' voice. And I observe, you know, yesterday's meeting, you have large number of uh, students are talking about mental health. Can you do a little bit uh, summary on um, what the discussion is? Absolutely. So our mental health subgroup is year in, year out, one of our most popular subgroups because obviously it's a great issue, not only within our district, but nationwide. Um, mental health has always been a cornerstone of student advisory group. And one of the focuses that they're looking for this year is really helping to implement additional resources for people that are in situations where they could have uh, mental issues or recognize mental problems and others going on. Really making sure that people have resources and access to things that would help prevent um, less than ideal situations. And in addition, this year, we're newly, we are going to incorporate a substance abuse group into student advisory group, and particularly that mental health subgroup, because we do feel like that's an important piece and an important component of mental health, particularly in the teenage population. Very good. Again, Lucas, well done. Um, thank you again for your leadership as well as for joining us tonight and giving us a summary. We'll look forward to uh, working with you throughout the year and having these summaries. So again, thank you. Thank you.
All right, we have uh, other students, uh, and this section is really for any students who want to sign up to give public comment, certainly are invited to do that. So I have a Gravin Krauts, I have a Jackson Superit, and we have an Owen Wicks. Gavin Krauts, are you in the audience to come and speak? And not seeing Galvin, how about Jackson Superit? Jackson? And I apologize if I did not pronounce your last name correctly. Yeah, no, it's all right. Uh, it's Jackson Superat. Superat, thank yeah. you. Um, so I'm a senior over at Legend High School, and I really want to just talk about the bullying inside of schools right now um, concerning the mask mandate that's going on. Um, personally, um, I'm having a lot of anxiety and like guilt whenever I put on a mask because all of this is really just one-sided. It just feeds to one side. And I've had teachers come up to me and tell me that it's one-sided and that my opinion does not matter about the max mandate, um, which is kind of hard for me um, in the schools. Um, I've had a teacher come up and take a video and photos of me uh, not wearing my mask properly. Um, and when I asked her to delete the photos, she denied to do that unless she gets my name. Um, I've been forced to do push-ups inside of the classroom. Um, this is not the teacher's jobs to punish us or students to rid ridicule us. Um, their job is to teach in the classroom. You know, you can leave that up to admin. Um, so I don't want to be, you know, told that you know my opinion is one, or that all this is one-sided and it's supposed to be one-sided. Um, yeah, so I'm happy that we broke away from Tri-County Health, and I'm just hoping that we can make the right decision to abolish the mask mandate um, in schools. Very good. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you. Well, um, next is Owen Wicks. Is Owen Wicks in the audience? Point of order, President Ray. I think, is it a poll? What? I thought this yeah, we'll, dis we'll discuss right? the standard for public comment um, regarding reaction to public comment momentarily. But I do want to just check to make sure I've, I've given all our students an opportunity. Ms. Marsh, do we know about Owen Wicks? Was he supposed to be online or? OK, if you'll remind me again um, at the appropriate time, that uh, will remind me that he's someone that's still out there. So those are the only students that we uh, had that were signed up to speak to us. Thank you uh, again to all our students. Um, we are going to move on then to public comment. Uh, there are two policies that guide how public comment to the board is received. Board policy KE, public complaints, and board policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. Policy BEDH states that comments can be focused on policy matters and board policy KE outlines the appropriate channels of communication for a concern to be addressed prior to bringing it to the Board of Education. Public comment is placed prior to action items proposed on our agenda. Public comment is placed after our information only presentations so that the public commenters can hear information that may be pertinent to their public comments. Those wanting to make public comment are requested to complete an online form prior to our meeting. And from this point on, the deadline to submit this form will be noon prior to our meeting. In order to maximize accessibility for all public commenters, the choice of presenting in person or remotely is provided. Those who are signed up to provide comment remotely, please remember the following. First of all, once you're called in, your phone will be muted until your name is called. Please make sure that you are not running the meeting on a computer in the background and that you are in a quiet environment. Keep in mind that the meeting broadcasted on YouTube is slightly delayed, so it is best to only listen to the meeting through your phone. Once I call your name, please state your name and ask if you can be heard. I will respond for you to continue. The board would like for all discourse that occurs in this room to occur in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Everyone in this room plays an important part in modeling appropriate behavior and promoting an environment that is fair, safe, and dignified. To maintain this decorum of mutual respect, speakers are asked to refrain from using individual names in an offensive manner as this only distracts from the issue of concern. 
in order to make this place safe for everyone. I would also ask that there be no reactions after a comment is given. This includes applause, verbal comments, aggressive nonverbal behavior, or judgmental tones. I'm asking the, the, the audience to remain silent to help us protect and respect all perspectives. Please also keep in mind that there may be a need to interrupt you if a board director calls for a point of order. If this occurs, all comments should stop until directed to continue. Each speaker is allotted up to two and a half minutes to address the board. You will hear a tone signaling the end of this time. Out of respect for other commenters, please keep your comments within this two and a half minute time frame. Due to the number of public commenters tonight, I will also ask speakers to stop immediately once you hear the tone signaling the end of the two and a half minutes. Doing this shows respect to the other public commenters who are waiting. If you have handouts you would like to have distributed to the board, please provide these to Assistant Secretary Sandy Marsh on the end of the dais. Please know that this is our time to listen without engaging in discussion. However, your comments will certainly be considered as the board continues its work tonight. Also keep in mind that this is not the only way, or this is one of many ways to communicate with the board. If you are seeking an answer to a specific question or would like to have an interactive conversation, please consider again contacting Assistant Sec Secretary Cindy Marsh to schedule a phone or in-person conversation. It is also important for our listening public to understand that public comments are not fact-checked, nor should the board's silence indicate agreement or disagreement with what is being said. So with that, we will now move on to public comment, and I will call off a list of names. We're gonna begin with um, public commenters that are currently calling in for remote comments. We will start with Triana Burdick, Iko Browning, Ivanka Kopik, and Jessica Kaiser. Triana Burdick, are you there? Yes, I am, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Burdick, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. I am the mother of two kids in Douglas County School District. And no, I'm not a fake caller calling from outside the district, um, as some have may implied. I am speaking today to say thank you for continuing to follow the Tri-County Health and CDC guidelines. Before the mandate, my son received five exposure letters, including a quarantine notice, and my daughter received one. Um, we actually had very few notices compared to other friends of ours. A few weeks into the mandate, and we have not received a single notification for either child. My daughter, who suffers from anxiety, has been able to settle into school, knowing that all students in her class are masked, making it that much safer for everyone. As a family, we have been able to focus on what's important in school, academics and socialization. So again, thank you. Now that the mandate has been in place for a few weeks, how do you plan on continuing to enforce it? There still seems to be inconsistency between the schools. Please stay the course with the mandate and other mitigation measures. Please hold charter schools to the same standards as other schools. They should not be exempt from the mandate. We need to continue to work together as a community to keep our children in school. Aside from COVID, COVID, or COVID protocol, I want to thank the current board for working tirelessly since 2017 to return our district to one of the top districts in the metro area. Thank you for working so hard to help improve test scores. It is great to see our test score rankings move to one of the top spots. Thank you for working to increase teacher pay and retention. Keeping good teachers is key to the success of our children. Thank you for increasing mental health resources and working to bring more equity into our district. We need to keep this positive momentum going. Please know that many of us in the community see you and we see the hard work that you're putting in. We may not be the loudest in the crowd, but we support you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burdick. Iko Browning is next, Ivanka Kopik, Jessica Kaiser, and then Kelly Dixon. Iko Browning, are you there? I'm here. Okay, go ahead and come up to the podium. Thank you. We had you down as remote. <laughs> I had to up a couple times. No worries. President Ray, directors, thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity. 
I'd like to start with a quotation. Malign force seems at work in our common life that turns every disagreement into an argument and every argument into a clash of cultures. So much of our politics has become a naked appeal to anger, fear, and resentment that leaves us worried about our nation and our future together. That is a quote from George W. Bush from his statement on the anniversary of September 11th. I believe the goal of education is to help all kids achieve their highest potential. This starts with having safe schools, physically safe to protect our kids during this ongoing pandemic, psychologically safe where kids are supported and are able to grow and learn. I would also like to see DCSD educators and staff achieving their highest potential, using their talents and creativity to support our kids' development. I support DCH, DCSD's strategic theme number five, equitable distribution of resources. My mother-in-law is a retired teacher. She had the following analogy to help me understand the concept of equity. The fire department doesn't go to every home and put a little bit of water on each home. They go to where the fire is and they put it out. I have two kids. One is neurotypical and the other has special needs. They have very different educational needs. What my son needs to achieve his highest potential is different than what your son needs to achieve his highest potential. What my son needs is different than what my daughter needs. Providing my son with a specialized and intensive support that he needs to be the most functional he can be does not prevent your child from getting the support and services that they require from their school. This is not a scarcity situation. We can do both. The purpose of focusing on equity is to get all kids the resources and support that they need to succeed. In our Douglas County community gatherings, including the DCSD school board meetings and Tri-County Health meetings, I see a struggle in balancing the needs of the individual and the needs of the community. This is not an either or situation. Both are important. We must balance the needs of the individual and the needs of the community. Supporting excellent education and safety during this continued pandemic is a challenge that we must rise up to as a community. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Browning. Ivanka Kopik, uh, nope, audience, again, remember we want silence after each comment. Ivanka Kopik, Jessica Kaiser, Kelly Dixon, and Turin Castro. Ivanka, are you there? Okay, thank you, Mr. Blair. Kelly Dixon, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Dixon, please go ahead. Hi, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm a resident, parent, and taxpayer in Douglas County, and I want to thank the board and the superintendent for your efforts in support of an equitable and safe learning environment for our students. I'm looking forward to continu continued work on the equity policy, especially in light of recent events reported to have occurred at DCSD schools. There have been multiple student incidents at our high schools, even in recent, re recent weeks, that highlight the need for stronger education around anti-racism. When I heard of an incident, I inquired as to how the Equity Advisory Council would be leveraged to reaffirm the district's values within the school and the community. I was told the Equity Advisory Council is in its planning stages and would not be focused on specific school incidents of racism. The school in question will be working with district leadership and the Equity Advisory Council to ensure every student has access to a high quality education and is cared for. I'm happy that the student code of conduct outlines steps taken for individual incidents. And I am eager for the Equity Advisory Council to move out of the planning stages and towards real impactful systemic change so that all students in the district are comfortable and confident walking into their schools each day without fear of discrimination, let alone verbal or physical assault. I also appreciate the boards and the district's efforts in complying with the Tri-County Health Order and keeping our kids in school and keeping the entire community safer. Thank you again for your efforts and I look forward to hearing more about the board's implementation and maturation of the equity policy to affect real change in the district. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Taryn Castro is next. And then in person, we have Megan Birch, Krista Mann, and Matthew Smith. Taryn Castro, is she there? Not online, sir. Not online, thank you. All right, Megan Birch, Krista Mann, Matthew Smith, Latanya Brown. Mrs. Birch? Good evening. Hi, my name is Megan Birch. I am a Douglas County resident and parent to two DCSD students. Thank you directors and Superintendent Wise for your time tonight. As a social worker and parent, I specifically want to express my gratitude for the board's equity policy. I am excited about the potential in this equity policy and its ability to address gaps in our district. This policy can create rich opportunities for staff development and opportunities for all of our students to flourish. 
As this policy develops, I would love to see increased learning opportunities that include accurate, honest history and elevates the experiences and innovation of BIPOC and LGBTQ folks and people with disabilities. Some of the comments made in this public forum and in our community have amplified the need for our students to learn accurate history to create greater understanding of the current context we live in. Comments have been made about how everyone has equal opportunity for success in this country. Our BIPOC and LGBTQ students and parents have shared with us their lived experiences of racism and homophobia in our schools and in our community, sharing with us that equal opportunity does not in fact exist for everyone. Comments have been made comparing mask policies to the Gestapo. The, the Gestapo was a brutal police force in Nazi Germany that was responsible for torture and many other atrocities. Comparisons of mask policies to this brutal force is incredibly dismissive of the genocide of Jewish people. There have also been statements made in the larger community about children's gender identity and wearing masks. Statements comparing a person's gender identity with wearing a mask are dismissive to the validity of our transgender and non-binary students and are rooted in transphobia. And this is the importance of having an accurate understanding of the lineage of this country and the world. An accurate teaching of history allows us to see the gaps that still exist in our country. We are able to see how we as individuals can show up for the collective of the community to support each other. And that's what this is really about, right? A world where folks have safety, well-being, joy, and can flourish. When we address the needs of folks who experience the most barriers, BIPOC folks, LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, that lifts all of us up together. It allows our students to build a future that includes forming a more perfect union and creating a community where there are actual actions of liberty and justice for all. Thank you again for the equity policy. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Krista Mann is next, Matthew Smith, Latanya Brown, Gianni Brown-Gibson, and then Leah Raffaelli. Krista Mann, good evening. Hi, I'm Levi. I don't want, I don't like to wear a mask besides. They don't work. Children should be able to have a choice to wear one or to not. I will not wear a mask to school. I asked my mom if you're going to laugh at me because I have a different, different beliefs than you. I think school board, I think the school board should stand up for what all students believe, not just the ones that you agree Are we allowed to take these off to speak? Sure. So I would like to echo my son's sentiments that the Board of Education should represent all students and that the board and the district should not be shaming or turning a blind eye to shaming of students if they cannot or choose not to wear a mask. This board has shown that they are politically motivated to mask students, not following the science and the data that continues to show that students are at low risk for complications from COVID and at low risk for spreading COVID. As such, I would like to recommend that parents consider voting for the kids first candidates, Becky Myers, Kaylee Weniger, Christy Williams, and Mike Peterson that support parents' choice and are not politically motivated in making decisions for students in this district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mann, and thank you, Levi. Matthew Smith is next, Latanya Brown, Jayani Brown-Gibson, and Leah Raffaelli. Mr. Smith, are you here? Seeing not, we'll move on to LaTanya Brown. Is LaTanya Brown here? Okay, and Jayani, is Jayani Brown Gibson here? And Leah Raffaelli. And I'm gonna go back while, just take a pause here for a second. Uh, Mr. Blair, Ms. Marsh, do we have anybody online that we need to draw in at this time, or? I don't think I Is Owen, is Owen here? Very good. My name is Owen Wicks. I'm a student at STEM School Highlands Ranch. Recently, due to the frankly illegal Tri-County Health mandate, masks are required again, much to my dismay. 
I have a sensitivity disorder, which causes me to be hypersensitive to any physical contact. For some perspective, I don't like it when my family hugs me or when they ruffle my hair, which is relatively normal behavior. On top of, on top of that, every morning, I spend around five minutes messing with my socks so that they fit just right, or sometimes grab a new pair because they don't feel right. This is, this is something I've been doing for years and still haven't gotten over. Now there are these masks, masks that haven't even been around for two years that I'm most certainly not adjusted to, nor is it likely that I will ever be. To elaborate, masks are very distracting for me as they make my skin crawl, and every moment I wear them, which is, a, or they make my skin crawl every moment I wear them, which is a big problem as I need to concentrate during school. And if I can't concentrate, it makes it very hard to understand and then apply the information in which I, I need to understand. On top of that, the issue of my concentration, masks also cause huge communication issues. I like to think I'm reasonably articulate and good at, a communicate, or good at communicating, but most people at my school, including the teachers, are not as focused on that, which causes a solid number of regular communication issue, issues that I have to deal with. In essence, masks make my life very difficult, which leads me to what really ticked me off. Masks are entirely ineffective. According to findings published by the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, the American Journal of Infection Control, the International Journal of Nursing Studies, the Journal of American Medical Association, and the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and quite a few others, though I can't list them all here, masks are almost entirely ineffective with common cloth masks having a 97% penetration rate on top of being bad for your health due to the bacteria environment they create, and, that they are actually, and yet they're actually encouraged in our schools. If the schools and Tri-County Health were truly concerned about our health, they wouldn't even consider masks as, as the data just doesn't support them. In addition to this, if it was truly about health, they wouldn't sell garbage in the lunchroom that is entirely processed and has no nutritional value. If this was really about health, no, no one on this board or anyone else would support masks. It, all mask mandates truly are, are half-brain attempt at conformity, an attempt to look like you're actually doing something about COVID and the health of the students rather than what is actually true, that you are aiding and abetting sickness in our schools. Thank you, Mr. Wicks. Next on our agenda is uh, Taryn Castro. I understand Taryn is in the room now. And after Taryn, we will go to Jennifer Barnes. And IT team, I did not hear the signal go off. Uh, is that, I didn't hear the signal go off at the end of the two minutes. Okay, thank you. I thought I thought I saw us reach that, so I just want to make sure. Thank you. I can take your extra time. <laughs> good evening, Ms. Castro. I can talk for a while. All right. Uh, good evening, board. <sighs> Never attribute to malice that which can adequately be explained by stupidity. Is it stupidity or malice that you've put into place and or continue to comply with an illegal health order or a non-existent health order? that carries no statistical significance for students? Is it stupidity or malice that you have compelled teachers to enforce rules that you yourself have never tried to enforce? Is it stupidity or malice that you continue to pretend that your compliance in this health order that's non-existent in Douglas County, which removes parental rights, is based in compassion for your students, teachers, and parents, Teachers, students, and parents, please understand the people on this board do not care about you. Pretending otherwise is to willfully ignore the evidence. Students' health, mental and otherwise, have not given them pause. Students being harassed and targeted by adults and teachers has not given them pause. Teachers refusing to comply has not changed their approach. Principals defending the rights of their students and their students' parents has not caused them pause. So again, I ask this, is this stupidity or malice? Either way, you have shown that you cannot serve this community. You should all step down, to be honest. This is complete an utter theater. I am every day visiting my mom in the ICU with COVID. I know what that looks like. I am not saying that COVID is not real. It is very real. But stealing a child's, even 18-year-old kids and 17-year-old kids, normalcy so that you guys can feel like you're doing something 
masking compassion with narcissism. Please look at these statistics. Look at what we're telling you. Parents will do the best for their kids. I promise you, I do the best for my kid every day. I just implore you to please listen to the Douglas County Health Department. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Moving forward. Next is Jennifer Barnes, and then Haley Benson, Annie McMichael, Lindsay Collier, and Sandy Garcia. Jennifer Barnes, are you there? Director Ray, we actually have a few. We have a Tanya Brown, Gianni Brown, and Mia Ravielli online. Okay. I had that you wanted me to call Jennifer Barnes next. Is she available? Is she online or is she in person? Apparently no longer here. All right. And I'm sorry, Mr. Blair, who do you have next online? Uh, Latanya Brown. Latanya Brown. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right, Ms. Brown, please go ahead. Hi, I've been here before. Um, so I'm Latanya Brown. I'm here today to support equity and diversity in DCSD. The Parker Chronicle wrote an article about DCSD's lack of diversity in February of this year. The article describes some of the ridiculous and ignorant behavior students have had to endure, as well as their families. The Nextdoor app has also had many instances of the same behavior. I've spoken to many parents of color whose students and family members have endured hate crimes and other ridiculous behaviors. I'm beginning to feel like families and students of color aren't wanted in Douglas County and DCSD. These very behaviors warrant equity and diversity lessons and or education. Stating that we don't want equity and diversity in our schools sounds a lot like of the 1960s segregation. So many families, including my own, have had to place their student at other schools in other districts because of this behavior. I know that the board and so many others don't uh, want students to leave DCSD. Um, so I thank you for supporting um, equity and diversity work and look forward to helping out as best I can. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Jayani Brown Gibson, are you there? Okay, Ms. Brown Gibson, if you can hear me, we can't hear you yet. You may be on mute. Hey. Hello? Is this Jayani? Oh, uh, yes, this is Jayani. Yes, please, Jayani, please go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, board. My name is Jayani, and I'm a former DCS student as well. I used to be at Chaparral High School my past two years. I'm at Smoky Hill High School for my senior year. I feel like DCSD needs equity and diversity in the schools, not only for students, but for teachers and staff. Students of color should feel welcome at their school and teachers should want to build relationships with students of color. I had a positive experience at my former school and I hope that you take equity and diversity very seriously and make the changes needed for the DCSD community. I'd like to thank Ms. Betsy Cook, Mr. Space, Mr. Cruz, and Ms. McGovern for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown Gibson. Leah Raffaele is next. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Raffaele, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for the time to talk. I am a parent of four children in Douglas County School District. I want to say today the kids are safe. They always have been. Mortality rate for kids from COVID-19 is lower than the flu, including the Delta variant. If kids should be masked now, they should be masked for all other diseases that are much more threatening. I realize this is not the best way to get through to the mass cultists but it is a method for getting through to parents who think it will go, that this will go away without us getting involved. All totalitarian regimes eventually self-destruct, but in order to prevent further atrocities, we must continue to speak up. The mask mandate this year will be the vaccine mandate next year. The masking cult has never been within the realm of science. Cloth masks do not work to stop the spread of viruses. One virus is 600 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. For a very fine cloth, the openings are about the size of a human hair, so that 600 viruses can fit through every opening, about 14,400 openings and one square inch. This is not taken into account the gaps around the sides nor the habits of kids to touch everything and remove their masks, etc. Studies show cloth masks have penetration rates as high as 97%. 
Fauci himself said early on that masks do not work. The World Health Organization found community masking does not work. Many studies, I located 11 in one day, show long-term mask wearers have increased likelihood of viral infection due to effects from humidity, bacteria, and oxygen deprivation. A virus does what it's going to do. You cannot save a forest by saving one tree. Now science and data call the politicians and bureaucrats who have created lockdowns and mandates liars. This is evident with several members of the FDA Board of Scientists resigning after the CDC over overruled their advice and are continuing to give boosters to young people, although there is a known risk of myocarditis. The mask mandate is anti-science and contradicts all the data and hence is irrational. Adults would rather deprive their kids of the normal life they had and deprive them of things like seeing each other smile and faces to satiate their own paranoia. It's a form of Munchausen by proxy, pretending your child is sick to satisfy your own psychological needs. Masks are best very dirty handkerchiefs. The kids play tag with at recess and at worst child abuse. We can simply say, no, I'm not putting this mask on my kid's face so you can feel better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raffaele. Jessica, Jessica Kaiser, I understand, is online. Ms. Kaiser, if you can hear me. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. I am a parent of two children in the Douglas County School District, and I just wanted to speak tonight to say thank you to the Douglas County School Board. <clears throat> By implementing and enforcing a mask mandate in our public schools, you have given our children the gift of stability. Because of that, I feel confident in continuing to send my at-risk son and my unvaccinated daughter to in-person school, and they are thriving. They're socializing, they're making friends, they are learning and growing, they're happy. Many in our community, including um, some of the candidates that are speaking here tonight, seek to upend the stability for our children we are, when we are so close to getting a vaccine to protect all school-aged children. Don't let them do it. DCSD BOE policies contemplate following TCHD policies, not that of a newly formed Douglas County Health Department. And there is simply no reason to change the BOE policy. The work of implementing a mask mandate in our schools is done. Our kids know what is expected of them. And what a wonderful gift to teach them about doing something that you may not like in order to care for others. I ask the board to keep um, the current state of affairs on masks until a vaccine is available to protect all school-aged children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kaiser. Um, back to in-person, we have Haley Benson, Annie McMichael, Lindsay Collier, Sandy Garcia, and Michelle Superett. Haley Benson, good evening. My name is Dr. Haley Benson. Last month, you told us that masking children is necessary to decrease the infection rates of COVID-19. As of September 1st, when the mask mandate for all children was implemented, Douglas County had a positivity rate of 6.6%. Yesterday, Douglas County had a positivity rate of 6.7%. Mandatory masking therefore has not reduced the rates of COVID-19 and only continues to cause more harm than good. I've already spoken from a medical perspective about the harmful effects of masking children. Therefore today, in an effort to get this to resonate further, I'm going to tell you all a bedtime story. Once upon a time, there were two children called Rachel and Lucy. Rachel was forced to wear a mask in school and she hated it. She couldn't understand why she didn't have to wear a mask when she played with her friends after school and when she did fun things like bowling and skating. Consequently, she had a negative association with school. It was this hostile and scary environment. She didn't apply herself to her studies. She often missed information due to her teacher's voice being muffled by a mask or leading to poor grades. She had inadequate social skills as she had not had the benefit of learning nonverbal communication from facial expressions. She had worthless jobs, broken relationships, was miserable, and died early. Meanwhile, Lucy was able to choose not to wear a mask in school. Lucy was empowered by the fact she was able to make her own choices. She loved going to school. She couldn't wait to get there to see her teachers and classmates' smiling faces. 
She worked really hard at school and ended up having a lifelong love of learning along with a career in medicine. She had excellent communication skills and positive social relationships. She had purpose in life, had a positive impact on the lives of others and lived happily ever after. Which child do you want to be responsible for? Make the right decision and remove the mask mandate so you can have sweet dreams tonight. Thank you, Dr. Pinson. Annie McMichael is next, Lindsay Collier, Sandy Garcia, Michelle Superad, and Sean Benson. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, my name is Annie McMichael. I'm standing before you today to advocate for the children that are being affected by this mask mandate in Douglas County. I have regularly sat in on meetings all about masks and its efficacy towards children. But I'm here to say that the policies that have been implemented are not in the public's interest. However, there's officials such as yourself that have taken this mask mandate and have used it to control the children in Douglas County. This is not how it should be. We, the parents, do not need you, the officials, to step in front of us and tell us what is best for our children. We, the parents, know what is best for our children. Picture this. There are students in our county that wear the same mask every single day. I know this because I've seen it firsthand. And also, picture this. There are students in our county that have learned to judge others, whether they're wearing a mask or not. And they have learned this from traits that are being passed down from their parents, and it'll continue to go on. We, as parents, I know all of you can be parents too, we need to work together to show our children that there can be choice in this country. How is any of this helping our children in the future learn to be leaders, make choices for themselves, and learn to properly socialize? If anything, we are teaching our students to sit down, shut up, and just comply with whatever they are told. There needs to be a separation from board members and parental rights. Now let's take, at the, let's take a look at the need for face masks. According to Dr. Eli Palnovich, a professor of medicine at the University of Iowa's College of Medicine, he majors in epidemiology, he says, and I quote, no, not only do you not need a mask, but you shouldn't be wearing one. He goes on to say the average healthy person does not need a mask and shouldn't be wearing them because there is no evidence that wearing a mask on healthy people and children will protect them. They wear them incorrectly. They can increase the risk of infection because they are touching their face more often. This is only exasperated in children who have yet to develop the discipline to not touch their face, especially considering the majority of adults can even resist the temptation. All in all, we, you need to let the parents decide. We know what is best for our children. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Lindsay Collier is next. Sandy Garcia, Michelle Superat, Sean Benson, and Michael Nichols. Lindsay Collier. I am not my wife. <laughs> I would never claim to be either. So uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife. She uh, couldn't be here tonight. So, um, so mark this day, September 28th, 2021. Uh, Douglas County has made the wonderful milestone of sitting off on a new path uh, for our county of nearly 400,000 residents and creating our own health board for the first time, which will eventually transition to our own health department. With this change, I ask that you alter the district's policy back to what it was to the first week of school to a recommendation versus a mandate. Think back to that first week of school. This, the smiling faces on kids and the teachers were so happy to see uh, the children return and the parents were excited because we were getting our kids back into school instead of being with them every day during the summertime. Um, she said that, not me. Uh, and, uh, but now, you know, after that, it goes to the mandate and then all of a sudden, now we have, just as a lot of people had mentioned, the divisiveness between uh, students versus students and teachers versus students and administration versus the students. The data available to us for our kids, two to 18 years old, continues to show a low level of COVID, specifically in Douglas County, far below our levels last year when no mandate for 10-year-olds and younger were in place. 
Nothing has changed with our children in that time. So what has changed with that data? We as parents must have our parental choice reinforced by this board, and that's not happening and doesn't seem to be happening. It's time to begin adhering to our own county-specific health board. My kids deserve nothing less. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Sandy Garcia is next, Michelle Superat, Sean Benson, Michael Nichols, and Shannon Yoshioka. Sandy Garcia, good evening. My name is Sandy Garcia. I'm a parent to children in Douglas County School District. I'm also a medical professional. I'm a physical therapist. I have a bachelor's degree. I have a master's degree, and I've studied epidemiology. I've studied infectious disease. In fact, I've worked in the hospitals for years, starting when I was 18 years old. We would wear a mask on occasion, and we would put it on outside the room and follow infectious disease precautions. And you would gown and glove and don and doff and put it on and take it off a very precise way. And when it was done, you would put all that in an infectious disease bin. And um, what we're doing now is just theater. It is not necessary to wear a mask. And what you're doing to the children forcing masks is child abuse. It's violating their body. It's putting something on them that is not required that people that are not medical professionals are saying you have to wear this. And it is not a proven prevention of any virus. Why did we not use it for AIDS, HIV, Ebola, swine flu, bird flu, on and on? There's viruses. There will be viruses. They're not going away. But masks are not saving you. If you want an N95 and you want to wear it properly, you get it fitted by a professional. And then you get a bag put over you with um, aerosols sprayed in there. And you are asked whether you can smell it or taste it. Um, can you do that with your mask right now? Can you smell right through it? It's not going to protect you from anything that's viral. Um, and the true emergency is suicide, mental health with our children. Children's Hospital declared an emergency. Do you not see what's going on with these kids these days? It is terrible. They have anxiety, they have depression, and the masks are only making it worse. I do not know anyone that has been hospitalized or happy to say died from COVID, but sadly I do from suicide. I've talked to a parent who had to deal with their child that I knew who was on the sports team with my daughter. COVID right now in, in Colorado, 18 children are hospitalized per Governor Polis's conference today in all of Colorado. Douglas County has been zero, zero, zero for weeks with children being hospitalized. So you need to make the right decision and veto and end the mandate of the mass and let the children Thank be you. free. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Michelle Superat is next. Sean Benson, Michael Nichols, Shannon Yoshioka, and Robert C. Marshall. And again, I, I short-term memory with the last name. I apologize. No, you did it right. Oh, did did I, I, oh good. Did All right. It? Go ahead, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Michelle. I'm a parent of six in Douglas County, a DCSD teacher, and a recent COVID survivor. Having COVID was tough, no doubt. I was in the hospital for almost a week on oxygen and several medications. I'm incredibly thankful for a supportive community that rallied and helped my family during this time. In spite of that, I'm here to remind you that your job is to represent the parents, us, me, our community. We have spoken time and again that choice is what we want. Your job, other people's job, is not to decide for us. For me, we're free to choose. If you truly want to follow the science and data and not just make that a re-election tagline, it, it's not there to mandate mask wearing. I don't regret my choice. I refuse to live each day in fear of a virus that is 99% survivable. My older children in high school, one who spoke earlier, also utilize their choice. And let me tell you, the culture and climate in the schools is anything but safe and positive. A certain board member publicly posted on Facebook that they feel providing a welcoming, safe, and a positive learning environment is important to them. I can tell you that is not happening. You have turned educators into enforcers, teachers into spies. 
We have teachers taking pictures and videos of students, which I'm pretty sure is illegal to report them. We have teachers threatening to give zeros for grades if they don't wear their mask, threatening to make them do push-ups during class, as you heard my son was required to do. Promoting bullying and peer pressure by letting other students harass them and scream at them and exercise their choice. How dare you turn a blind eye to all of this and wash your hands of this or pretend that this isn't happening. Again, this is your choice. You can change it back to recommended. Our job as teachers is to instill critical thinking and give the joy and love of learning. Not tell them what to think. I'm not their parent, neither are you. To think that you are creating a safe and positive learning culture is mocking what today's schools really are. You are actually creating a time bomb. Thank you. You Ms. have a Super choice. Yeah. Sean Benson is next, Michael Nichols, Shannon Yoshioka, Robert C. Marshall, and then Michael Peterson. Good evening, Mr. Benson. Good evening. <clears throat> Well, I have more science and data here again, but you're not interested in following the science. You're interested in following the politics, while those of us interested in the science actually read the science. But I'm sure you're just sitting there with your finger on the mic button where all you hear is blah, 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 science, misinformation, blah, 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 my kids, hell, just waiting for my two and a half minutes to be up so you can cut my mic off, just like a flight attendant looking for someone showing nostril so they can tell them to shut up and obey. But does anyone really want to go to school to be as painful as, uh, and punishing as flying is now? The TSA mask mandate was extended on April 30th and again on September 13th. Does anyone really believe that this won't be the new normal and we'll be able to fly mask free again? It's no surprise that fights and conflicts are breaking out every day on planes, but there's a very simple fix to all that. Give people back their freedom to breathe. Is this what we want our schools to look like? Do we really want school to be as painful and punishing as flying is now? This could go no other way with flying, and what do you think is gonna happen in our schools? You know what my daughter told me the other night when I talked to her in the bed? She said that she was scared to go to school now because everyone's wearing a mask and it's actually making them sick. There's been five outbreaks in her school since you implemented this mandate, and guess how many of them were not wearing masks? Zero, none. They're all wearing masks. The only kids getting infected were the ones wearing masks. And upon immediately implementing the mandate for all kids over the age of two, the positivity rate for Douglas County went from 6.6 .6 to 7.4% in one week. Here's the timeline on the county positivity rate that shows it going up after the universal mask mandate. How well do you think this is working? Well, my daughter is strong and brave. She hasn't worn a mask a single day this school year, and she never will. She won't be scared by your fear tactics, and she will stand up to anyone who tries to force her to wear a mask. To all other parents out there who don't want to be forced to mask your kids, don't do it. Do, 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 politely decline to wear a mask and stand your ground. You don't need an exemption form. You just need to be brave and stand up against this child abuse. You might not be able to do it on a plane, but you can do this at school. Ask me how I know. If the children and parents who represent the majority opinion in this county take action, then the district will have no choice but to repeal this mandate. My daughter will not be wearing a mask at school, and she will be there every day for in-person learning. This mandate is nothing short of child abuse, and I will not tolerate it. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Michael Nichols is next. Uh, audience, Shannon Yoshioka, Yoshioka, Robert C. Marshall, Michael Peterson, and Jason Casse. Michael Nichols, good evening, sir. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to do a uh, follow-up of my speech that I did back in August. And um, I just want to thank everybody for kind of making the bridge forum graduation happen. I'll make this short and sweet, though. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully the mass mandate will be eradicated ASAP. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Nichols. Shannon Yoshioka, Robert C. Marshall, Michael Peterson, and Jason Kase. Good evening, Ms. Yoshioka. Good evening. Um, angry, Sorry. angry guy you left. Good evening, board directors and other staff. I'm gonna to touch on several topics. If you don't get some of my references, I highly recommend the Hamilton soundtrack. 
I've lived and taught in Douglas County since 2006, and I've spent 26 years in public education. I'm also the parent of two Douglas County graduates, and I've raised two biracial children, and I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted that every little thing in this community has to be a fight. I'm exhausted from hearing, do your research and look at the data. Here's some anecdotal data. My class typically uses 26 boxes of Kleenex on average every year. One exception, the 2021 school year. Guess how many boxes of Kleenex? Three. Three boxes. Masks mitigate the spread of illness. And I know this because I was in the room. I'm exhausted from hearing that we don't need an equity policy in Douglas County because it'll teach white children to be racist. I inherited my first child when I met her father. She was a bright and beautiful and spunky kindergartner. And when I changed my name to Yoshioka, I wondered aloud one day if I should have my students call me Mrs. Y, because Yoshioka might be too difficult. And my new daughter looked at me with hurt in her eyes, and she said, it really hurts my feelings when people don't even try to say my last name. I've thought of that moment many times over the last 20 years. I've never had that thought before because I never had to. Our children are going to have the opportunity to work and travel farther and wider than any generation in the past. Let's prepare them to meet and interact with people from all over the world, not just to get those that live on their street. I've never forgotten that moment because I was in the room when it happened. I'm exhausted from the last seven election cycles. I'm exhausted at devoting so much time to convince this community that what happened here from 2010 to 2018 was chaotic and bad for kids. I have a whole list of things that happened, but I'm going to run out of time. Just know that the same people who funded and promoted the board directors from 2009 to 2018, which include none of you, are funding and supporting the four candidates on the other side again. And I was in the room when all that happened. I urge anyone listening to talk to your children's teachers. I can promise you that the vast majority of us don't want to go backward. Thank we you, want Ms. to go Yoshi forward. Yoshi. Thank you. Robert C. Marshall is next. Michael Peterson, Jason Cassay, Diana Gould, and Brandy Bradley. Good evening, Mr. Marshall. So I'm Bob Marshall. I was going to uh, just get right into my thing, but as a quick little nugget, um, I do support the masks in the schools. I think it keeps them from turning all the little kids into vectors, little mosquito vectors running around spreading the disease, even if they don't get sick themselves. But I came here to talk about uh, the critical race theory and how it's being used as an emotional wedge issue against your equity policy. I have more than a passing familiarity with critical race theory. My law school admissions essay I did on American realism and critical legal studies, the grandparent and the parent of critical race theory. And I know, and you know, critical race theory is not taught in the Douglas County schools. It's a postgraduate legal education. So what are they all worried about? What are they concerned about? I went and looked online on what is the target of this critical race theory that's non-existent and being used as a wedge. Well, in Nashville, the people that are attacking critical race theory and other places around the nation, going after this book, Ruby Bridges Goes to School, saying it's un-American, it's age inappropriate, and it's giving people the wrong, interest about, wrong ideas about race. So I ordered it, four bucks on Amazon, read it. Takes five minutes if you're a high school graduate. Brought 12 copies here for the entire board to read. And when you're done with them, please pass them out to the audience and let them read it. Anyone who thinks this book is un-American is un-American. Ruby Bridges says nothing bad about any white people. She says some people wouldn't let black kids go to school with white kids. And it's hard to miss in the book the federal marshals, all white, walking her to school and protecting her. And it's hard to miss the white teacher the only one who had the courage to go in and teach her that's in there. And it's hard to miss that she said the US government was the one who said black kids and white kids should be able to learn together. What's more pro-American than that? So again, this is what these people are attacking. And this is something you should push back on. It's age appropriate. 
Five to seven-year-olds, Ruby Bridges was six when she had to put up with this. So please push back on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Michael Peterson's next. Jason Cassay, Diana Gould, Brandy Bradley, and Juan Candle. Good evening, Mr. Peterson. Hi, good evening, and I am one of those kids first candidates that was referenced earlier. Um, we know how to put this thing back together. We know how to achieve academic excellence, and by we, I mean all of us here. The three things that we need to achieve academic excellence are simple. Engage students, engage parents, and excellent teachers. And we have those elements in the school district, but the policies being enforced by this board are tearing them apart. We are putting parents against parents. We hear it every night. We are putting parents in opposition to teachers and teachers in opposition to parents. And we are putting kids in the crossfire. We heard from some of them tonight. Parents feel that this board is not listening. They know that you're, you're not listening because you're not acting on their suggestions or you're not giving them a big why as to why that's not happening. They feel like this board is stepping in and usurping their role as the parent in decisions, in risk making, in informed curriculum, and just honoring that role of being able to raise their children as they see fit. You're stepping in against our teachers. You're asking them to be enforcers of mandates. You're putting them in opposition to our kids. And you respect the teachers by giving them some discretion and letting them teach because they're so good at it. And you compensate them, not raise money from our taxpayers, put most of it towards staff, and then leave them as the lowest paid average salary in the surrounding metro district. And students that are caught in that crossfire, they are missing smiles because they can't see their teachers and they can't see their students. It's hard to communicate any type of empathy, belonging, and inclusion in some of the good things that you're trying to do um, when you're stuck behind the mask. We can't convey those nonverbals. And worst of all, we are not helping mental health. I defy you to say that masking up our students and denying them all that emotional learning is actually helping the mental health crisis that we obviously have here in Douglas County. And where are we headed on a trajectory? The thing that parents and our teachers feel most is a mandatory vaccine mandate coming down. We have had board members speak in support of it. One of my candidates is in support of a mandate coming down to vaccinate all the teachers and students. And that will lead to an exodus in this district of excellent teachers, new and old students and families, the likes of which you have never seen. It will destroy the district. And in my final comments, control is not compassionate. Choice is compassionate, and that's what we intend to bring. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Jason Cassay, excuse me, audience. Jason Cassay is next. Diana Gould, Brandy Bradley, and then Juan Candil. Good evening, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Jason Cassay, and I have three children in the Douglas County Schools, ages 13, 8, and 5. This board's docility in adopting and enforcing the tri-county mandates has generated an atmosphere of derision throughout the entire county. My third grade daughter, who suffers from anxiety, speaking about mental health, has been harassed by teachers for not wearing a mask, and when she does wear one, it, she is denied a mask break. Recently, she was forced to wear a mask provided by her teacher, which had a noxious chemical smell to it that made her nauseous. She did not tell her teacher in fear of being forced to switch to e-learning. This is a child who struggles with allergies and breathing in a mask. The very people we have entrusted her care to are the same people who have abandoned her in the crusade for mask compliance. The fallout from this daily abuse has led to my daughter asking us to find her a therapist. Our five-year-old kindergartner initially fought against wearing masks until her teachers coerced her into compliance. At this age, it is so easy to indoctrinate them. My eighth grade son has been threatened by his principal with a direct push to e-learning, with complete disregard for the disciplinary phases outlined by the superintendent. The principal admitted that she takes frequent and lengthy mask breaks. Why is she afforded this freedom while our children are denied the liberty to breathe freely? Our daughter's assistant principal said that we should demand mask compliance and not have discussions with our children regarding current affairs that affect them. He also stated we should find a mask with better airflow to ensure that his coveted compliance numbers are met for his puppeteers. I believe in parents' choice because it is the parents and not the oligarchy who know their children best. This board's actions have proven that you care more about the illusion of masks, mass safety, receiving government grants for COVID, and attempting to indoctrinate our children into mindless drones that fall in line to your unconstitutional policies and agendas. It is indisputable 
that the education, safety, well-being, and mental health of our children do not matter to you. I turn to those sitting behind me, those that are listening to this meeting, if what I have said resonates with you, take action and make your voices heard this November by voting for all four candidates, Myers, Weiniger, Williams, and Peterson. Finally, I want to leave you with a quote from Seneca. Time discovers truth. Time heals what reason cannot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassay. Diana Gould, Bradley, Bradley, and Juan Candil. Diana Gould, are you here? All right, Brandy Bradley, are you here? Mom of four boys in Douglas County Schools, the board has failed their number one duty to advocate for the education, health, and well-being of our children. You guys have become so obsessed and fixated on COVID, pushing over-sensationalized data and fear tactics on students and parents. You've used exaggerated numbers about crowded pediatric ICU beds to push your agenda to muzzle our kids. Even when our commissioners opted out of Tri-County, you dug your nails in even harder. Numbers never lie, but liars use numbers. 2.1 per 100,000, that's the number of children hospitalized with COVID according to the CDC. American Academy of Pediatrics, 18 children in Colorado, zero to 19 have died. In contrast, 166 out of 100,000 was the rate of children, zero to 17 hospitalized for the flu. We have never masked for the flu. We've never mandated a flu vaccine, quarantines, or mandatory testing. So I ask you again, why the PHO for masks? Governor Polis still has not passed a state mandate. Our kids are not dying from COVID, and there's been a flat line of uh, hospitalizations since before the mandate was passed. Since the beginning of COVID, Douglas County has had 37,000 deaths or cases with 286 deaths. That's a 0.0076% chance of death, which if it's so contagious, then how can 76,000 people pack the Broncos Stadium, 50,000 pack Coors Field mask-free without massive COVID outbreaks? Or how can kids from different schools play sports together and churches be full to capacity without major outbreaks? College football stadiums bursting at the seams, but we're making kids mask up to go to homecoming. Think about this, my second grader has not had a normal classroom experience since starting school. Where is the freedom of choice? If vaccines and masks are so effective, then why do you care that I choose not to vac vaccinate or mask up my child? Ask yourself that. If the school board said you weren't allowed to mask up your immunocompromised child, I would also be fighting for your freedom of choice. You guys have used baseless and illogical science to try and scare parents into complying all while hiding behind Tri-County. Who are you gonna hide behind now that Douglas County is divorced tri County? You've attempted to make our children political pawns in your game against Douglas County commissioners and in doing so, our students have fallen behind. You have underestimated Douglas County parents and their love for their children. You have awakened a sleeping giant and we are coming for you and we will see you in court. Parents wake up and vote for a new majority board that will put kids and teachers first without negotiating your children's learning with the teachers union. Vote for kids first candidates, Myers, Weingar, Williams, Peterson. They stand for freedom of choice and they won't be coerced into putting a price tag on your child's head. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Juan Candil is next and then we'll end this session with Amity Wicks and take a break and uh, finish out public comment. So Juan Candil, yep. good evenings. Good, ev uh, good evening, good evening school board. As my, na as my name says, I'm an Hispanic. And I'm, in, and I'm in, um, I am an immigrant. I come from the South American country of Colombia. I want to say that I find what you have been doing lately to Douglas County not only evil, but also familiar. You see, my country does not progress. My country is engulfed in political and civil turmoil because the politicians there have made their goal to pin each, to pit, to throw the people against each other. So we're so distracted that we're not going to hold them accountable. And all of you are doing the same by dividing this country, this county. But you're not going to succeed because unlike the people of Colombia, as me, people see through all the theatrics that you guys are doing. The candidates, of, the candidates of Kids First are a direct response of what you have been doing. They want to give parents the choice of what to do with their kids. They want to give a stronger parental choice. 
Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Candillo. Amity Wicks is next and then board will take a break. Amity, is Amity here, Wicks? All right, we will, oops, is that Amity? Oh, okay, all right. Okay, well, let's take this opportunity to take about a 12 minute break, or I mean, sorry, about seven minute break and then we'll reconvene.
to reconvene the board at this time. If we could ask the audience to uh, find a seat. We're going to continue on with our public comment. Uh, we'll begin with Stephen Collier, Deborah Flora, Kaylee Weiniger, and Courtney Lawless. Uh, Steve Collier. Right, good evening again, board. Speaking for myself, not my wife this time. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, what I am coming to speak about is uh, certainly not funny at all. So I submitted uh, to the Douglas County School District at 12.05 this morning three Open Records Act requests regarding union-backed electioneering that took place, and we have evidence to show it, uh, on uh, Friday during the in-service day at uh, Douglas County School District properties. The four schools that came forward, and the individuals that brought this information forward uh, are both either staffers or educators that work at these schools who out of fear and intimidation know that they cannot bring this information forward uh, because they know that they will be singled out by the principals and by their peers. Uh, so much for inclusive environment for our teachers. But they did bring it to folks like me who know that they, uh, do, they, they do have an advocate and a voice uh, on their behalf. So the following schools, Stone Mountain Elementary, Cimarron Middle School, Legend High School, and Thunder Ridge High School, we all have, we, each of them, we have people who've come forward or we have evidence showing that uh, at the break rooms or in libraries that morning, staff meetings were had, and of course it just happens to be on in-service day when there are no parents or children on hand, uh, highlighting that, hey, if you wanna get your car painted for the union back candidates, many of whom you know that may be sitting up here, um, you can go ahead, put a sticky note on the back of your car, and then uh, bring it around a little later. We have photos from Stone Mountain, uh, uh, Stone Mountain Elementary that took, uh, took place at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it was actually printed out pamphlets that were put on the windshields of each of the cars, and it was up to the teachers to indicate how they wanted their cars painted. We also have the imagery of uh, the vehicles that were moved from the parking lot because the handouts were putting on all the vehicles, that were moved uh, to a uh, school, a, a public street lane, where the teachers, and again at nine o'clock, certainly not on anyone's lunch break, were painting their cars in support of the union back candidates that do sit on this board. This is a grave violation of Fair Campaign Act of the state of Colorado. You will be getting an email, I was trying to do it actually while I was sitting here, but you will get an email from me uh, shortly. You now have an expectation, and superintendent wise, I'm looking at you as well, to get to the bottom of this. Your principals knew that this was going on because nothing happens at their school without their knowledge. We want answers as to why Unibag candidates picked the in-service day to go ahead and do electioneering okay, on Mr. government Klein, property. You. I Deborah demand Moore you get to the next. bottom of it. Kaylee Weiniger. Courtney Lawless, Matt Cassidy, Deborah Woyer, Deborah Flora. Good evening. Hello, I'm Deborah Flora. I'm a Douglas County mother, parent, and I am also the founder of Parents United America that has risen by hundreds just in the last month because of everything going on. Today I want to talk about No Place for Hate. This is a program that is already implemented at over or at least 34 schools in Douglas County and costs over five figures annually of taxpayer dollars. Let me be clear, we all want children to be kind and respect one another despite race, gender, or any other differences. However, we do not send our children to school to be indoctrinated. Despite the deceptive name of No Place for Hate, let's take a look at what is actually in this program. How about the recommended reading list. For ages five to eight, the story of Harvey Milk and the Rainbow Flag. In case anyone isn't aware, Harvey Milk bragged about having sex with underage boys in his autobiography, not appropriate for five-year-olds. There are also books rec recommended by No Place for Hate for four-year-old girls su suggesting that they may be lesbians. They're getting potty trained at this age. Let's be clear about that, not appropriate for four-year-old girls. Students are told to discuss whether the police should be, quote, reformed, transformed, or abolished. Students are encouraged to report one another. They are also, well, let's look at the self-proclaimed goal of the program. And I'm going to quote, each one of these is a quote from No Place for Hate. 
It highly encourages schools to move beyond kindness to social justice. A section labeled for educators and not for parental review is titled 10 Ways Youth Can Engage in Activism, including political protesting, walkouts, creating posters, songs, and chants for marching in the streets. Their goal, is, and according to themselves, is, quote, to affect social change and assist educators in teaching current event topics through a lens of diversity, bias, and social justice. Sounds a little bit like CRT, although people say it is not anywhere in our schools, but it is, and tens of thousands of dollars are spent on it. Now, let's look at what the real job of the school board and the schools are. To address the plummeting academics, barely over half reading at proficiency level, less than half at math, and we're told to be happy about that at one of these school board meetings. We will be happy when our schools focus on the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, not radicalization. Education, not indoctrination. I'm asking you to remove this radical program from all DCSD schools so we can stand together to teach kindness, not move beyond it, teach it. Teach that and respect. Thank you, Thank you very much. Kaylee Weiniger is next, Courtney Lawless, Matt Cassidy, and Kelly Mayer. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Kaylee Weininger, and as you probably know, I'm running for a seat on the Douglas County School Board this November. I'm here before you today as a Douglas County School District graduate and a parent of a current DCSD student. Today, the focus on my public comment is on positivity and hope. I believe both qualities are necessary in order to move on from difficult times. Many people look to their leaders during times of trial in order to find hope and examples of positivity. Douglas County School teachers, staff, and students have had a tough past year and a half. Unfortunately, I do not feel current leadership is providing that desired hope and positivity. Instead, there is a tone of intimidation and fear. The following are all personal concerns that parents and teachers have shared with me. Due to commands from DCSD leadership, teachers are being told to make lists of kids who are not wearing masks. Principals are calling parents three times a week asking if they've changed their stance on masks. Families are being sent letters threatening that their kids will be moved to alternative education options and additional school-based consequences if they do not comply. Charter schools are being threatened that their charter will be revoked. How are these acts of intimidation encouraging an enriching learning environment focused on academic excellence? They're not. They're encouraging anxiety and fear. Six some years ago, we had teachers leaving our district in droves due to a frustrated fear-based culture. That frustration is back in a different form. Us Kids First candidates promise to change the tone at the top to one of positivity and hope. We want to rebuild trust in the community. All four of us candidates have kids, grandkids, and beloved teachers in this district. And therefore, every decision made will personally and directly affect us. If elected, our community can breathe easy and have hope knowing that there are school board members making decisions based on principles, common sense, choice, and truth, not based on fear. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weiniger. Courtney Lawless is next, Matt Cassidy, Kelly Mayer, and then Kathy Lees. Courtney Lawless. Uh, Matt Cassidy is next. Good evening. Good evening, directors. Uh, my name is Matt Cassidy. I have two children in the district. As we've heard this evening, masks and vac vaccines have taken center stage when it comes to what's top of mind for people concerned about what's going on in schools. I'm here to tell you, though, that while the passions are strong on both sides of the mask and vaccine issue, the real issue is parental choice and parental involvement. I'm here to tell you there are parents throughout this district who are watching how much this district cares about their perspective, their choice, and their freedoms. The first thing that ignited par parental passions during this calendar year was the board's passage of the equity policy and the very uneven rollout of the educational equity policy. As I've testified before, there's nothing wrong with the equity policy on its face as passed. However, the rollout was widely acknowledged to be a disaster. The very first staff training, the Gemini group described white male, able-bodied Christian and straight people as the dominant culture that was, has done so much harm. They also stated unequivocally that we know for a fact that the darker your skin in this country, the more harsh your outcomes in any facet of life and attempted to convince participants that, quote, our intentions are irrelevant in this conversation because equity is about outcomes and impacts. It's not about intentions. They stated a desire to strategically undo systems and institutions that were built brick by brick, law by law, and policy by policy. 
Mr. Wise recognized that these statements and this attempt at indo indoctrination was radical and not in line with the thoughts of the parents who stood here at this podium for four hours telling you how displeased they were, wondering how in the world this happened. I was one of them. I wondered how did the schools become so disconnected from the parents and I had to look in the mirror. I had to look in the mirror and recognize that I had allowed it to happen. I had simply delegated my children's education to the Douglas County Schools and while I was away, some th things happened that I didn't like. My kids' teachers were told that white, able-bodied male Christian straight, my white, able-bodied male Christian straight son was part of a dominant culture that had done a whole bunch of harm to people he didn't even know. Every day he goes to school and I wonder whether the teachers subject to this indoctrination are giving my son a fair shot. It's because I checked out. No more. My son, like my daughter and every other student in the Douglas County School District, deserves a fair shot. No one should be defined by his or her immutable characteristics, and that's why I joined the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, to ensure that all children, white, black, male, female, gay, straight, whatever, they get a fair shot based on their merit, regardless of their immutable characteristics. I appreciate the board's willingness to hear from me and to meet with me on this issue, but I want to continue to fight for the equal rights for my kids. Thank you, Mr. And I encourage all of you to do so. Kelly Mayer is next, Kathy Lees and Amity Wicks and Sarah Wu. Hi there. Good evening. Good evening, Superintendent Wise and Board Directors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Kelly Mayer, and I am a longtime resident of Douglas County. I have nine children. Four have already graduated from the Douglas County School District, and I have five more that will be coming through for the next 12 years. It is safe to say I have a lot of history with this district. I have seen it go through a lot of challenging times. I have to say, this past two years have been some of the most challenging to navigate. As a former educator, I know kids and teachers do best when they are in the classroom face to face. As a parent of students with special educational needs, I know my kids do best in the classroom. Last year was rough. But as the parent of immune compromised kids, and I have an 80 year old mother, I am so thankful that you have made the hard decisions to make sure that our whole family made it through last year without getting sick. And again this year, with two children still too young to be vaccinated, I am so grateful that you made the decision to give our kids the absolute best chance to stay in school by requiring masks in the classroom. The other day, I heard a self-described old woman share the story about what it was like to make her kids wear seatbelts and sit in car seats. She reminded us all that most people over 50 never wore their seatbelts while in the car as children and climbed all over it. When seatbelts and car seats became required, most parents thought that they would never be able to get a three-year-old to sit in a car seat. It was too constraining. It was too hard for them to do it. She said that what people say about kids wearing masks sounds exactly the same, and she's right. I require my kids to wear seatbelts and masks. And interestingly, they have never complained. They understand that masks and seatbelts keep them safe. I wanna thank you again for keeping kids safe, following science, and requiring masks in our school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Kathy Lees is next, Amity Wicks, Sarah Wu, and then Tegan Braun. Good evening. Hi. Uh, greetings, directors and superintendent Wise. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Kathy Lees. I have a senior and a sophomore at Thunder Ridge. I also have an 82-year-old mother that just moved into Wincrest. And I'm so grateful that you're allowing, that you're following public health order to requiring students and staff to wear masks at school, lowering the risk of my kids exposing their grandmother to COVID. It's really reduced their own stress about getting their grandmother sick. I wanted to take the time to share with you my newly found appreciation for the Student Advisory Group, or SAG. I've always appreciated the district placed a priority on giving the students official voice in the district. And tonight we've already heard about the amazing work that SAG is doing. I had always assumed that SAG was a group of students that thrived in the school environment, that belonged to all the clubs, were high flyers academically, and were going to college. All great characteristics of students, but certainly not all students. I recently learned that this was not an accurate assumption. This year, both my kids applied for and were accepted to be on the SAG. As you know from their fat past public comment, my children are very passionate about the climate and culture of their school and community, as well as the mental health and physical safety of students and staff. Both my kids are excited about the opportunity to provide consistent voice to neurodiv 
a consistent voice for neurodivergent students, LGBTQ plus students, and students that may not be going to college. These are students that typically struggle with school. They are at risk for mental health issues and don't always have an experience, opportunity to experience the district, what the district has to offer. My kids now hope to affect positive change in their community by working on SAG. Thank you again for being one of the few districts in the front range that provide students such opportunities to advocate for themselves and students and families, as well as keeping kids safe during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lees. Amity Wicks is next, Sarah Wu, Tegan Braun, and then Andy Jones. Good evening. Hello, my name is Amity Wicks. I have come tonight yet again to urge you to stand up for medical freedom and unmask our children. I've recently been under the tutelage of an attorney who has been enlightening me about law, specifically constitutional law, as it relates to my rights as a parent to make medical decisions. The United States Constitution is the highest law of the land and all other laws are to be subject to its authority. Our state constitution is modeled very closely after the US Constitution. Both have three branches of government and a system has uh, checks and balances. Only the legislative branch has any authority to write laws and determine criminal penalties. Article five, section one of the Colorado Constitution vests solely in the legislature and the people through polls the power to write laws. The Colorado State Constitution also stipulates that the legislative branch may not delegate its powers to any other agency or person. Specifically, the legislature cannot delegate to an administrative agency the authority to, to declare and act a crime. Through its order, the DCHD has made various declarations of non-compliance crimes. Their orders violate the Constitution of the State of Colorado and therefore violate the rights of its citizens, specifically the fundamental right of parents to control the upbringing of a child, including the medical decisions for that child. Parental rights are ancient and predate government. These rights are expressly protected in the First and Fourteenth Amendments, and our state's constitution echoes these rights. I, as a fit parent, have the exclusive right to make decisions without unwarranted interference by state actors. As an elected representative of the people, you took the oath of office wherein you swore to uphold the constitution. Do you understand that by abiding by the unconstitutional order by Tri-County Health that you are complicit in the violation of my constitutional and human rights as a parent? The health board has no lawful authority to make medical decisions for me or my children. What's more, you are actively and willfully participating in the psychological, emotional, and physical abuse of healthy children. The art of triangulation, the deflection of responsibility, has been on full display. We are just following orders. How many violations, how many abuses, how many atrocities have been committed because people were just following orders? Many, like myself, will not sit idly by and allow this. We understand the slippery slope we are on, and we are determined to hold you and others accountable for your role in these violations of rights and abuses perpetuated on our children. Our hope is that you would uphold your oath as promised and change course. If not, we will pursue action that will bring legal consequences to be felt in this life. No matter what happens in this life, though, we know for sure that the day will come when you will stand before your maker and account for your actions. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Sarah Wu, Tiga Braun, Andy Jones, and Diane Schultz. Uh, audience, again, just a reminder. Thank you. Ms. Wu, please go ahead. Good evening. Hi, my name is Sarah Wu, and I'm from Castle Rock. Many of you know me because I give all the treats to the local teachers, staff, and admin. <laughs> I was born in the South, and food is love. And I appreciate everything that DCSD has done for my kid and for the kids in the community. Tonight, I want to put my son's experience on the record. He's an elementary student in a neighborhood school, and he did virtualing last year, uh, virtual schooling. It was rough. <laughs> There's never going to be a good option during a global pandemic, but we made the best of it just like everyone else. This year, he really needed to be back in the classroom. Academically and socially, he was suffering, and so was I. Uh, I was concerned to send him back unvaccinated because I didn't want to get his classmates, teachers, or staff sick if he had an asymptomatic infection, and I also didn't want anyone to get him sick either. To keep, from spreading, to keep him from spreading COVID, I made him wear a mask starting the first day of school. It was an easy choice for us because he doesn't mind masks, and we're lucky there. Shoes are a much harder argument in my household. However, I was disappointed that so many other parents in the district didn't send their kids to school with masks. They didn't value preventing their kids from spreading COVID to others. 
There's no reasonable way for me to prevent others from exposing my son to COVID at school if they won't wear masks. As the case numbers went up in Douglas County, my husband and I grew more nervous for our kids and we restricted our family's activities outside of school to limit our exposures. This was our choice as parents and we were privileged to not have to take our kids shopping with us and to be able to shop during quieter hours or make other adjustments to reduce our risk. Every parent has to make choices for themselves and for their kids on the risks they will take and COVID is no different. Our community values parent choice here strongly because we know each family's priorities and abilities are different. However, we also value public health and safety, hence why I'm currently wearing shoes, as are you. I'm really relieved that this board is supported requiring masks in schools to ensure that every student has the ability to attend school in person the safest way possible. Everyone that enters the school building is allowed to take on as much risk as they like in their personal lives, but when they enter a building filled with unvaccinated children, masks prevent them from spreading COVID. Thank you for taking the public health order from Tri-County so seriously to make a difference to my son and all of the kids who can now safely return to in-person learning. Thank you, Ms. Wu. Next is Tegan Braun, Andy Jones, Diane Schultz, and Don Lee. Good evening, Ms. Braun. Hi, how are you? My name is Tegan, homeschool mom of four, in support of parent choice. Per the Denver Post on September 23rd, coronavirus cases among school-aged children between 6 and 17 hover around 300 cases per 100,000 people in schools that do not require masks, while that number is closer to 250 per 100,000 in schools that require masks. It's important to look at the raw math to evaluate the actual impact of mask mandates in school. If you mathematically reduce the case counts of 250 masked and 300 no masked, per 100,000 by a factor of 1,000, down from 100,000 to 1,000 students, which is much closer to the number of students at many schools, this equates to 2.5 student cases where masks are worn versus three where there are no masks. For a larger school with 2,000 students, double the case counts to five no mask and six masked. This data confirms that we all, what we already know to be true, forcing tens of thousands of healthy kids and adults in schools to wear masks has basically no impact on COVID cases among students. We are forcing students and school employees to wear masks to prevent one case of COVID in a school with 2,000 students. Further, this study tracks cases, not severe illness, hospitalizations, or deaths among kids, which is one child under 18 in all of Douglas County over the past 18 months. This is not statistically significant. Did you know that in order to practice medicine on a human being, i.e. force mask wearing, you must have a medical license? Which of you are doctors? Where is the doctor-patient relationship agreement in which the parents of 64,000 kids in Douglas County have signed for you to practice medicine on their child? According to Commissioner Teal, quote, right now there is no public health order mandating the wearing of masks in Douglas County, Colorado. It's no longer a tri-county health mandate. It is a Douglas County School Board policy. Ultimately, the fact that you all have carried this out goes to show that you are not looking at actual data coming out of Douglas County. Why? Is Douglas County School District in possession of or slated to receive any state, federal, or private funding and or any grants on the condition of universal masking and upcoming universal vaccine mandates for staff or students in the district? You are destroying the very entity you are elected okay. to protect. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Lastly, Kevin and Krista, what are you next. doing when you're voted Don out Lee, in November? And then Kelly Pointer and then Michael Richardson. Andy Jones. I rise tonight to continue a theme that needs to be beaten like a drum until change, real change occurs. Weighing heavy on my heart and certainly the hearts of so many is the public health emergency around our children's mental health. Yet while many focus on the ephemeral issues of masks, I am more concerned that this board continues to ignore the physical security of our children. Today, I had the honor of having a conversation with a hero father of a hero son. John Castillo lost his son, Kendrick, almost two and a half years ago. He is still grieving and he's still angry. He's still angry at many of you at this district. Kevin Lung 
thinks that John and I have okay. forgotten. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, if you recall, we were requesting that you not sorry, use names. Sorry, how about if I say Director Lung? No, it does, still the same. If you could just continue with your comments saying a director, I'd appreciate it. Um, Mr. Blair, if you would give Mr. Jones his time back at 1.30, please. We've asked that we just not use names in an offensive manner. A silly rule that limits our First Amendment rights, which is, of course, what you guys do. But a director who sits on this board that John and I have not forgotten his most egregious behavior as he ran the STEM school vigil that night after Kendrick was lost, tragically. This director that sits up on this board who ran around with the other Democrat politicians who politicized that event that night, it is not forgotten. It is not forgotten. You might think that that night when politicians hijacked that event, it was meant to be for healing, and it was meant to be for healing. But we remember. We look forward to a new team that will come in and return balance and focus, and a focus on safety in this district. I remind you, and I remind the people in this community who again think that masking is what's really important here, is that every single day our children go to school, your children go to school, and are they in the safest of environments? For over a year, for over a year, you have not once addressed in any of your, I've looked back at your agendas and you have not addressed physical security improvements in our schools. We're not asking for you to reveal sources or the things that you're specifically doing, but you don't even talk to us as the parents of schools in this district. So we now ask you, we demand that you talk about physical security and safety. And to the director who was there that night, we remember. We ask that this community bring balance back to this board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Next is um, Don Lee, Kelly Pointer, Michael Richardson, and Lori, Lauren Bostrom. Don Lee, good evening, sir. Hello. I used to think this equity and inclusion movement was a bunch of nonsense. I thought, in America, people accept you as you are. But now, I think there's something to it. I realize inequity of power structure, history of oppression, and there are victimizers and victims. This imbalance and unfairness and racial bias just hangs over us like a dark cloud in every facet of our lives. So where are all these oppressors? My neighbor? Can he be this dreaded, dangerous, and all-powerful white supremacist? Perhaps. But I know that he does not have any power over me. I don't know what is in his heart, nor do I care. As long as we are civil to each other, we can live as neighbors. So who are these people I'm supposed to be deathly afraid of? And, we'll, and what do you know? I found them. They're you. You see, only government, whether unelected bureaucrats or elected officials, have power to oppress and victimize us. I don't know what's in your heart, and frankly, I don't care. However, I do care about your actions because it does impact us and make real victims out of us and our children. You sit there and pretend to care about our safety, mandating this and that, and assuring us that you are not implementing this divisive and racist ideology into the curriculum, for you're doing it. My eighth grade son attends Rocky Heights Middle School. He's in Navigator's team, and almost every assignment given to him by his events Advanced language arts teacher has been topic of social justice, power imbalance, equity, racism, sexism, feminism, and so on. All the reading materials and questions she posed to kids were designed to indoctrinate them to be a social justice warriors in the name of teaching them critical thinking skills. And when I brought this to a principal's attention, he assured me that this was in line with academic standards and guidelines and staunchly defended the teacher. When I pushed them further, one of the things he suggested was that he supports me if I wanted to transfer my kid out of the school. Some tolerance and inclusion. Well, the scams are being exposed and you will not abuse my kids any further. I have already pulled two kids out of this district and will pull my last kid out this week, 
along with another student in the same classroom. But make no mistake, I will continue to fight for the other Mr. kids. Lee, thank you. Michael Richardson is next. Lauren Bostrom, Stephanie Ford, and Kathy Redmond. Is Michael Richardson here? I'm sorry, Kelly Pointer. I, Kelly Pointer? Yes, sorry, I, I missed that up. And Mr. Richardson, I'll get to you next. Uh, thank you. Kelly Pointer is next. Hello, good evening. My name is Kelly Pointer, and I have lived in Douglas County for about 12 years, and I'm the mother of two. We start, they started out in preschool and elementary when we moved here, and now they are in high school and college. So I've been paying attention for a long time about what's happening in our district. And I'd like to thank this board for allowing more public comments than I've ever seen from any of the previous boards from 2013 to 2017. Tonight we're hearing a lot about masks, the equity policy, and critical race theory, among other things. Regarding critical race theory, I'd like to mention that CRT is an academic concept that is more than 40 years old, and I question why all of a sudden it is a big deal across the entire country. It seems like it's just a way to divide, create more divide and rile people up unnecessarily. But most importantly, how does all this parent fighting help our kids? or our teachers who are already burned out and feel disrespected. I also came here to talk about something else. I would like to talk about the long-term health of our school district. I believe that masks are a minor inconvenience for most, and I realize there are exceptions to this, and that masks, I believe, are temporary in the big scheme of things. What's important is safe, in-person learning the financial health of our district, teacher and staff morale, stability, oops, the mental health of our students and staff, as well as academic and career technical opportunities for our students. Each of these thing, items have improved under the school board, but yes, I still believe there is work to be done, certainly. I would like to thank you for securing the first local funding increase for our district in 12 years, expanding educational opportunities for students, aiding security measures in our schools, and I know what security measures have been added to our schools, my son's school, because I attend the SAC meeting and or anyone can ask the principal as well. Repairing buildings that had been neglected under prior leadership and forgiving teachers a safe and welcoming learning environment as well as increasing the mental health resources available to students thanks to the 2018 Mon Mill Levy override. Thank you, Thank you, and I ran out of Thank time. You. Thank you, Ms. Pointer. Now Michael Richardson, my apologies. Lauren Bostrom, Stephanie Ford, Kathy Redman, and Alan Schell. Mr. Richardson. Thank you, President Ray, directors, and superintendent. I'm delighted to be able to be with you tonight and I want to thank the board for helping our students and staff to be safe in our schools. It's incredibly important. I occasionally volunteer at Chaparral High School, and I'm happy to wear a mask when I'm there as someone who wants to see our kids succeed, be healthy, and be happy. I want school to be fun for them. One of the things I value most is being friends with folks who don't agree with me. So. I appreciate the fact that you all are able to try and do that because you have a lot of folks who don't agree with you. And, and you have a lot of folks who do agree with you. And I want you to hear that. I have two daughters who graduated from Chaparral. And one of the best things about their time at Chaparral was that they could make friends there. Kids can still make friends. And I see them do that even when they're wearing masks. They make friends. Masks don't inhibit my health or wealth, welfare, as plenty of doctors and nurses can attest to. What masks do is keep our kids and our teachers and our staff safe and healthy. All of the students are safe and healthy, not just a few, but all of them. The other thing that it does is it really does give a sense of safety to our staff and safety to our teachers, and I appreciate that. That means that our teachers can spend more time teaching and less time worrying about other things. 
one of the things that our teachers can do is help our young people to be part of our community. And that's actually what we want them to do. We want our young people to grow up and to be successful at being part of our community. And that's what our teachers to do. We need policies that help us to work together, not pull us apart. And I know some districts spend all their time arguing instead of making decisions and sticking with them, even through loud and forceful opposition. I know you'll have opposition to good ideas as well as bad, but the fact that you continue to listen to our ideas and needs and wants is incredibly helpful to us and to our relationships as a community. Thank you for listening, for caring about how our students stay safe and healthy and happy. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Lauren Bostrom, Stephanie Ford, Kathy Redman, Alan Schell, and then Chuck Bradley. Lauren Bostrom. Good evening. Good evening. As of today, TCHD no longer has any say when it comes to Douglas County. The public health authority mandating masks in schools no longer holds any weight in Dugco. We all know that the new board that meets tomorrow will make this official and will not issue a new PHO. In fact, I'm pretty sure that um, you don't have any authority to make us wear masks at this meeting. Um, this is not a school. There is no state, county, or city mandate to wear masks. This is not a private business. This is a public building we taxpayers pay for. You do not have any right to tell us we have to wear masks to be here. So, back to the point. What are you going to do tomorrow? I wouldn't be entirely surprised if you just come out and say masks are still mandated. Um, but I want to come here anyway and ask you instead to be rational, stop playing political games, and stop succumbing to the fear mongering that I addressed last time I was here. I'm not quite sure what science you and others think we are not following. We are using studies and data you like because of the skew and skewed and fear-based headlines that we see, but you don't actually read the studies. I was going to cover the study that the other mother actually broke down, um, broke down mathematically to 100 factor, but I'm not gonna go over all that information again because that would just be useless because you probably weren't listening anyway. Um, but my main question, why are you going to continue to mask our kids? There are zero pediatric hospitalizations. There have been zero pediatric hospitalizations. Um, the very few cases of COVID that happens with kids are either asymptomatic or extremely mild. Um, but whether or not you believe masks cause harm mentally or physically or hurt our kids academically, it really doesn't matter. Because like I said, the, the data just shows no difference whether you wear a mask or not. It just doesn't. So again, why are you masking our children? Is it because you receive federal or state funding for implementing universal masking in our schools? Because we all know that that is something that has come up in many school districts and has been proven true. Um, so I'd, I'd really like you to answer that question for us if you are receiving funding for implementing universal masking. So in closing. Thank you, Ms. Bostrom. Stephanie Ford is next. Kathy Redman, Alan Schell. Chuck Bradley, and then Lily Porter. Stephanie Ford. Good evening, are you able to hear me? Uh, yes, Mrs. Ford, please go ahead. Lovely, thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephanie Ford and we have two children within the Douglas County School District. I'm a biologist and a chemist and I'm currently earning my master's degree in health administration. My purpose this evening is to highlight the importance of using data-driven science to fuel decision-making throughout the district. Douglas County ranks fourth best in satisfaction for school districts in the entire Denver area, serving 90 schools, 67,305 students in grades pre-K through 12th grade and an average student to teacher ratio of 18 to one. According to the state, test scores, 48% of Douglas County students test at proficiency levels in math, the statewide average being 35%, and 59% of Douglas County students testing at proficiency levels in reading and statewide average being 47%. Both of these statistics indicate that Douglas County test scores are 10 percentage points higher over the statewide averages. The graduation rate, as noted earlier, is 91.2% in Douglas County, which I think we can all agree is exceptional. Aside from the high rate of faculty turnover in recent years, coupled with an elevated degree of political bickering, the numbers demonstrate the climbing level of success district-wide. I was delighted to see the highlight of data at the opening of the meeting, and I applaud you for your continued efforts. 
Considering the extenuating circumstances of the global pandemic, the data reflects that the students of Douglas County continue to excel despite the challenges presented. I believe that it is our responsibility as parents, educators, and constituents to set the example of resilience and exhibit grace under pressure. I think that we can all agree that the ultimate goal is to keep our children in the brick and mortar institutions for their own educational enrichment, as well as their social development, well, developmental well-being. Statistical analysis exhibits an upward trend in completing goals within the district and the past year must be considered as a statistical outlier. However, slow the progress may be at some, at some times, we are charting progress nonetheless. Our students are performing above state average levels and it is absolutely attributed to the quality of professional talent we attract, as well as the countywide leadership. As a scientist, I'm appalled by the misrepresentation of virology, epidemiology, and the interest of public health in this meeting. Allow me to point out that you are speaking at the wrong board meeting. The school board is obligated to follow the Tri-County Health Department order and there is absolutely no room for non-compliance. Douglas County must submit a one year notice of intent to withdraw and must raise the necessary funds to separate. A final word on masks, it is not your personal right to be a public health threat. If you wanna put your kids first, get vaccinated. My final plea to Douglas County voters is to consider the most qualified and most experienced candidates for retention on the board while electing new members within those same parameters. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. you for your time and I yield back to the board. Thank you, Mrs. Ford. Kathy Redmond is next. Kathy, are you there? Okay. Okay, Mr. Bradley, are you there? Can you hear us? Hi, this is Chuck Bradley. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Bradley, please go ahead. Thank you. I want to make it clear that I speak for no candidates tonight. I speak for myself only as a parent. I am a parent of an elementary child in DCSD in the age group of six to 11 years old, the vulnerable age group that is unable to be vaccinated yet. The people from the anti-science slate of board candidates have been waving around a bunch of numbers tonight that really don't matter. It's a classic disinformation campaign. They wave around test positivity rates for the county as a whole, which actually includes adults. They don't tell you the child numbers, and that's because they don't want you to know those numbers. Let's talk about the only COVID number numbers that really matters when it comes to our most vulnerable children. Since the mask mandate for younger children has been in effect, Incidence rates for Douglas County six to 11 year olds have been sliced in half. That's right, since the mandate, cases have been cut in half among that most vulnerable group. You can see for yourself on the TCHD website, just click on pediatric school button. The other side talks about the law and the constitution, but what they don't tell you is that the US Supreme Court has reaffirmed public health laws over and over and over again, even when it comes to children. In the recent Indiana University case, public health laws were upheld at every single level by Republican appointed judges, including finally by Trump appointee, Amy Comey Barrett. These people wave around these mask studies that have not been peer reviewed or have been wholly discredited. And they probably think that horse tranquilizer can cure COVID. It's appalling and it's embarrassing. And it gives me real no pleasure to say this, because I too am a conservative and a Republican. Yes, you heard that right. Chuck Bradley is actually a conservative Republican, but your tinfoil hat, quack-based anti-science viewpoints mean that I cannot possibly vote for you. You are a danger to my child and I will vote against, every, vote against your slate every day of the week and twice on Sundays. As such, this conservative Republican will be voting for the slate of Lung, Holtzman, Watkins, and the fabulous Ruby Martinez who, by the way, has a PhD in nursing. Board members, I thank you for your service to our community and for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Mr. Blair, just double checking to make sure that we don't have anyone that's lingering out there that's online expecting to speak remotely. We do not, sir. Okay, and then Ms. Marsh, I'm also looking to you to see if did we have anyone that came into the room that had been signed up to speak that we're missing at this time. Okay, very good, all right. Well, first of all, I want to thank all our speakers tonight. Again, um, we hear you, and we hear that there's these very polarized viewpoints about universal masking, about credibility for who has the authority to require that. We, we hear certainly questions about data tonight. Um, we get that. We hear that loud and clear, and I think as you can see, we have people that have beliefs on both sides of the aisle. And I would just, again, just 
really encourage all of us to really recognize what the true enemy is. The true enemy is the virus. It's, it's, it's not each other. And I know that there's frustration. I know there's fatigue. We certainly believe that we see the light in the tunnel as things progress to a place where we believe we can become less and less restrictive. But also understand that this board supports its superintendent because our superintendent funnels all the voices. It funnels all the collaboration with our employees and our leaders. He pulls all that together to make those decisions. And um, this board supports that kind of decision-making process. We know that there's different perspectives. We get that. It doesn't mean that someone's perspective is right and someone's perspective is wrong. It simply means that we have different perspectives. We will continue to listen. We will continue to, to work diligently to move our district forward with these great obstacles and great challenges we have. But again, I want to thank all of you for being advocates, advocate, advocating for your children, advocating for your beliefs. We all have the right to do that. And I, I especially appreciate the respectful nature of our public comment session today. It was respectful. It was, we made sure it was safe, regardless of your perspective. So I do want to thank the audience for um, honoring that request that we make this a safe space for everyone. So with that, I will call public session to a close. And we will begin. And board, I'm wondering, are you OK to move on? Or do you need a quick break before we move on with our action items tonight? What's the, what's the pleasure? We take a quick break. Yeah, so we're going to take a quick break. And then we'll come back and we'll begin our action agenda items. We'll take about five minutes.
We're going to uh, go ahead and reconvene for the last half of our meeting, which are our study action items. Tonight we have a couple of, I think, pretty exciting agenda items. Um, probably, I, as, as I'm an old timer in this district, but for the first time in district history, uh, we are actually looking at selling surplus land. Uh, that this district Ray, is. I'm sorry. Uh, part of order, are we supposed to go through the consent agenda? Oh, thank you, Director Lung. <laughs> Always keeping me on track. All right, so before I get to the historic moment, you'll be sitting on the edge of your chair to hear that. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to our next agenda item, which is to approve the consent agenda, which includes the following items. An IGA for stormwater management, approval of a change order for Golden Triangle Construction for Highlands Ranch High School, approval of an IGA with our school resource officers from Douglas County Sheriff Department, approval of our DAC Unified Improvement Recommendations. And again, just uh, a shout out, not only to the DAC for navigating some moving targets with uh, our Unified Improvement Plan, but also Mr. Reynolds, thank you also for the very detailed explanation about some of the ins and outs in terms of how the UIP will be handled in the future. So again, a, a well done memo explaining that to us. We also have on the consent the uh, Fiscal Oversight Committee membership recommendations and the acceptance of our fourth quarter financial report. And then also an approval of our of a 21-22 school year supplier spend that's estimated to surpass Board of Education threshold specific to policy DJ. And finally, approval of personnel changes. Is there a motion to approve our consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Motion made by Graziano, seconded by Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray Aye passes unanimously. Next is the approval of the Board of Education's unofficial minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Motion made by Graziano, seconded by Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. And Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Now, moving on to the, uh, <laughs> the historic moment right now. You know, we have um, consistently looked for creative ways to provide funding for our district that has historically been underfunded for the things that we do for kids. And we certainly have looked at every possibility and one of the things that we discovered is we have land that um, certainly is considered surplus land when we decide not to build a school on that site. So land is, when a developer develops a development, they have to set aside a certain amount of land for schools with the anticipation that that could be used for school sites. So I'm really pleased with just a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, I think our long range planning committee uh, that certainly helps us decide what land is considered surplus land that we can consider uh, selling. Uh, certainly um, Rich Cosgrove, our chief operating officer who has um, been masterful at helping navigate these kind of issues. Our general counsel, Mary Clemish and others who have also helped us navigate this as well. And so these are the things that I think good fiscally responsible boards and districts do is they look for creative ways to continue to uh, find resources that really benefit our staff and students. And, and tonight's certainly an example of that. So with that, I'm gonna invite our chief operating officer, Rich Cosgrove to come and give us some more details about um, what we are about to do tonight. Mr. Cosgrove, good evening. Good evening, directors. On October 22nd, 2019, the Board of Education approved a resolution regarding the use of dedicated school sites. The resolution acknowledged that the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners had asked the Board of Education to consider the disposal of school sites if they were no longer needed for the foreseeable future for district use. The resolution also recognized that the Long Range Planning Committee designated four school sites as surplus 
and included the provision that the surplus sites not needed in the foreseeable future may be sold in accordance with applicable law and district policy. The two sites on your agenda tonight, Westridge Glen and Pinery, are two of these surplus sites. On June 9th, 2020, the Board of Education approved a resolution to waive bid requirements for the sale of dedicated school sites in order to dispose of surplus sites in an expeditious manner while maximizing their value for the district. On October 10th, 2020, the Board of Education approved an exclusive right to sell listing contract with CBRE, a commercial real estate firm to represent the district in these sites. And in August 2024, in August 24, 2021, the District's Board of Education approved a letter of intent from United Development Companies to purchase these two sites, Westridge Glen and the Pinery. Since that date, CBRE has facilitated the completion of, of the proposed purchase and sale agreements. These are the agreements for your approval tonight. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove, for that overview. Are there questions for Mr. Cosgrove regarding this transaction or Mrs. Klimish? Uh, obviously, there's some terms that we can't necessarily have conversation about in public because there are some contractual kinds of agreements that this is representing. But are there overall questions about this transaction, specific the one we're looking at right now is Westridge? Questions about that. So Mr. Cosgrove, my understanding is with surplus land, there's a certain amount of years that we have to wait before we get the full opportunity to sell it at market value. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thanks for the question. There's a 20 year first right of refusal um, that has passed for these sites. And the Long Range Planning Committee continues to update the land inventory annually. And um, surplus sites uh, will continue to be identified for future consideration by the board. Very good. Director Holtzman. And, and I think that I'm allowed to ask this question, so just let me know if I'm not. But um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the recommendation for the deed restriction, um, looking at the work that Western Demographics has done with us in cooperation with our staff and the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, because we know that for many, many years, um, former boards never looked at boundaries, um, didn't look very closely at school placement, um, and, and now we're doing a study to make sure that we're maximizing our capacity in our schools. Um, so are you able to speak to that at all or? Yes, so the restrictive covenant deed restriction in the agreements, that is reflective of the fact that consistent with the school capacity and boundary analysis performed by staff and endorsed and reviewed by the Long Range Planning Committee, that has shown that in the areas of these school sites, there are no needs for future school capacity. And in fact, to maximize the use of schools, to make sure they're effectively utilized, not overcrowded or not underutilized, um, we would not want schools on these sites because that could saturate the market and impact other neighborhood and charter schools. Directors, other questions? And then Mr. Cosgrove, my understanding is that the, we anticipate the proceeds of these two pieces of land to total $7.5 million, is that correct? That's correct. And closing of the documents would occur 30 days after final plat is approved by the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners for the development from United Development Companies. And as we, as we look at adding that to our our budget, it's important, I think, also to know that these are one-time dollars. And so in a moment, we'll talk about the use of these dollars or at least contributing to some of the things that we want to do. Um, but we also know that once this, these dollars are used, um, we don't get that like we do a mill levy override or um, that's, it, it, these are one-time dollars that we have to get creative with to help do some things that we feel like are important in our, in our system. So. Any other questions, uh, directors, regarding this overview? So we do have a, mo or a motion. I'm going to actually read it because um, there's a little bit of legal jargon in there <laughs> that we have to make sure that we speak to uh, because this is a contractual agreement. This is a, a, um, 
some, it is a sale transaction that we need to make sure that we're very clear about the conditions. So I'm gonna read it and then I will ask a board director to support the motion. And that is that the Board of Education approve the real estate purchase agreement for DCSD sale of the West Ridge Glen parcel generally located at the southwest corner of Bitterroot Place and Ironwood Street and consisting of approximately 10.7 acres, said parcel to be sold subject to a restrictive covenant and deed restriction, restricting use of the property for a public or private school for any grade from preschool through 12th grade. Is there support for that motion? I would, I would support that motion and, and make that motion. Um, and while I'm doing that, I just really wanted to express gratitude that our local jurisdictions like um, each of our cities and our county um, have processes in place that require developers in our community to dedicate sites like this or provide cash in lieu for the benefit of our students. So I, I just wanted to point that out for our community that you know we, or I, I should say, as a board director, um, really appreciate that and value each dollar that we are able to um, obtain for that site or in some cases we're able to put them to very good use. But it's just really critical um, to provide financial support for our students. Um, and just, just appreciate that because I, you know, somewhat related, but many of us realize that the state of Colorado, um, due to the budget stabilization factor, has underfunded our schools for, for many years, since 2009 when that budget stabilization factor went in place. Um, here in Douglas County, um, we've been underfunded by $650 million since then. So these dollars um, for this sale are very important to us, and I, I just, I'm excited about this. So motion has been made as spoken. Uh, as I read, is there a second? Second. Second to Big Graziano. Further discussion or comments from the board? Any other Discussion, reaction, thoughts? Going once, all right, let's go ahead and vote then. Director Chancho Shore. Aye. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Long. Aye. And Director Meek. Aye. Director Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Mr. Cosgrove, I know the next agenda item is also a parcel. I wonder if you would just give us some of the unique differences in this particular parcel that we're looking at um, selling as well. Thank you, Director. The Pinery School site is basically on the eastern fringe of Douglas County. We have adequate school capacity. It was determined as surplus from the Long Range Planning Committee, and um, it is not needed for future schools, and a school in that area would negatively impact the utilization of schools in the surrounding area. So for that reason, uh, the same uh, recommendation has been made. Very good. Directors, any questions regarding the detail of the Pinery um, parcel? Any questions regarding that? Thank you, Mr. Cosgrove. Again, I will read the recommended motion and then ask for a board director to uh, make the motion as read that the Board of Education approve the real estate purchase agreement for DCSD sale of, pine, of the Pinery parcel known as Tract 1, the Pinery Filing 6, consisting of approximately 12.35 acres, said parcel to be sold subject to a restrictive covenant and deed restriction, restricting use of property for a public or a private school for any grade from preschool through 12th grade. Looking for a motion to support. I so move. Motion made by Director Meek. Second. Seconded by Director Holtzman. Any further discussion or questions? Director Lung. So for item 21 and 22, I just want to uh, show the public how physical responsible this board is. And we also listen to a uh, Citizen Committee's advice. Dr. Hoseman and Dr. Meek um, in charge of Long Range Planning Committee and they look through all this portfolio and give us recommendations on 
how to best utilize the resources of our um, land and um, for something that we cannot utilize it for our school, we try to uh, make it to generate some more revenues for us so that we could benefit, giving maximum benefit to our student. And um, as Dr. Graziano, when he was in, the, when he is in the FOC, he was first, you know, who looking into everything that we can do to try to uh, get us maximum benefit from all the resources that he has. And things like this, thinking our box, shows that we collaborate with our committee, and, and this boss is also physical responsible and try to make sure that we can get every single dollars to benefit our student. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Dr. Long. Any other reactions, uh, thoughts before we take a vote? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Chancha Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Long. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is a resolution. Um, again, it reflects a commitment of this board and its board ends. We have a board end that speaks to making sure that our quality educators and staff have been recruited, developed, supported, retained, and celebrated. And we have recognized that this has been some trying times for our employees, extremely trying times, and we've asked them to persevere through some uncharted waters. We've asked them to do things that uh, we never thought we would be asking our staff to do. And we also know that our staff are tired. We also know that they desperately need to have some kind of indication that there's an end in sight, number one, but number two, that they're valued. And that this board doesn't just put words like the ones I read without action. And that's why this resolution that we're recommending tonight is really looking at providing our staff a one-time stipend to be able to show, number one, that we appreciate the fact that they have trusted the system um, as long as they have, whether it was giving up furlough days and then getting those restored. Um, they have literally worked with us through some of the hardest times I have ever seen um, schools have to go through. So I wanna read into the record this resolution because I think it captures some of the rationale behind why I feel like the timing is right and why I feel like we have a sense of urgency, especially to encourage our staff to continue to hang in there with us. Um, when I say us, I mean with the district um, in terms of making sure that we send a message, we want you to stay with our kids. We don't want our staff to, to leave out of fatigue and exhaustion. And, and we've seen it across the board with many organizations that are having a hard time staying uh, operating because of lack of staff or because they just don't have the workforce. And I think that's the sense of urgency for us is to communicate a message that for the sake of our kids, we want you to stay and, 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 and work with us to get us through again these difficult times. So let me read to you the resolution. Um, this resolution, as you know, language starts out with whereas statements that really build the rationale of why we want to take action. So, the, so to begin with, it says that the Douglas County School District Board of Education has the authority under Colorado law to, de to determine district employee compensation. And the board acknowledges that in response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the functions of the district and its mission to educate students, district personnel continue to be called upon to go above and beyond to ensure the success of district operations and student learning. And the board believes that one of the greatest factors that influence students' cognitive, physical, social, and emotional growth is outstanding educators and staff. And the board finds that the need to maintain ongoing morale in these trying times requires the board to find ways to recognize the courage 
and sacrifice of its employees, and the board seeks to retain its employees, reduce turnover, increase morale, and communicate the value of all employees for their commitment to Douglas County School District. And the board also remains committed to implementing a predictable compensation schedule for all employee groups that progressively move toward a regionally competitive pay for all employees. That's our rationale. That's why we are feeling the need to take this action. We have a couple of things then in terms of action that we'd like to take. Number one, the Douglas County School Board of Education directs the superintendent to provide a one-time stipend of $1,000 to all eligible, eligible district employees designated as full-time in workday. Uh, this amount, uh, the, the amount earned under this paragraph shall be distributed to employees in November or as soon as thereafter as practical. It also directs the superintendent to provide a one-time stipend of $500 to eligible district employees who are part-time status in workday. And again, with the same expectation that November would be the targeted date for them to receive that stipend uh, or th shortly thereafter. This board also in this resolution, the other action item is just to reactivate our commitment to what we've been doing since 2018 or trying to do with moving to a new compensation system. We've had to suspend that compensation system because at one time we were having to look at cutting $30 million from a budget. Um, fortunately, we were able to restore those cuts as well as restore the furlough days that our staff um, provided. But we also recognize that there's been a lot of work that our human resources team has done to really mo start moving us to an employee compensation system that makes sense. And so we had a resolution that we passed just before COVID hit us, which was transitioning to a new employee compensation system that really outlined conditions of getting that move forward so that it would be implemented as soon as possible. In this particular resolution, a request that we reactivate that resolution now, it's no longer suspended, and that the proposed implementation would begin the 22-23 school year. Um, so that's the rationale and that's the action. I know we have Chief Human Resource Officer uh, Amanda Thompson here um, for any questions regarding past resolutions or regarding the work uh, that has been done and or the plans that um, are already in the making to move forward with helping employees understand. But I also wanna make sure that there's an understanding that there's a difference between a one-time stipend and this new compensation system. The one-time stipend truly is an opportunity for us to say thank you to our employees and to do exactly as I have suggested in the rationale to really hope that that sends a message that we want them to stay and hang in there uh, a little bit longer until we can get through the stormy waters that we're in. That's different. That is, this is not a part of the new compensation system. So I want to differentiate off the, off the bat that there are two different kinds of actions that we're looking for this year. Um, Ms. Thompson, is there anything else that you would like to add regarding our, our plans for transitioning to a new compensation system and or if there's anything that you would like to add regarding this one-time stipend that we're proposing? Good evening to all of you. Um, in terms of the compensation project, please know that the finance team and human resources team continues to work very hard on uh, drafting and uh, proposing a new licensed compensation schedule that fits our board resolution or works towards as many of those qualities as possible, um, along with range reviews and um, adjustment proposals to our non-licensed groups as well. So there, even though there has uh, been an official pause and now for our new board resolution, a uh, um, reenacting or reactivating of our board resolution on our compensation work, we have continued behind the scenes to work on that. For example, um, our licensed staff will soon hear about a last call for any new 
um, university transcripted coursework since it has been uh, over a year since our last call for that so that we can ensure we have the latest employee data from our licensed staff. And then that will uh, help us to be um, as accurate and up to date as possible when we bring new information forward um, in the coming month. Any questions regarding the transition side or, and then I'll also um, ask for questions regarding the stipend, but any questions regarding the transition plans? And I know Ms. Thompson is planning, you already have some calendar dates, I think that you're planning to get out to staff to begin some of that explanation. We do. Mm -hmm. All right, Director Holtzman and then Director Lung. Yeah, it's just, thank you very much. Um, so the resolution we're considering would reactivate our compensation resolution. Um, I, I also know that you all are doing work on benefits also. And this board passed a, a resolution regarding benefits back in, I think it was January of 2019. Um, and then you did report back to us in May of 2019 for that year. And I guess I'm not asking necessarily that we, we reactivate that resolution, although it might not be a bad idea. Um, I, I just know that you're already doing that work, and so I, I just wanted to give you a chance to speak to that. Um, the previous resolution asked that we would look at providing employees with comprehensive benefits comparable to neighboring school districts, modifying the comprehensive benefits made available to district employees only after the opportunity for ample feedback and input from employees, and reviewing and addressing the district's short-term disability um, and or sick leave benefit that reflects best practices for ensuring fairness and employee satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to give you a chance to speak about, um, because when we talk about compensation, you know, benefits goes hand in hand. Yep, absolutely, thank you so much. So yes, we um, have always uh, continued to work um, annually in reviewing comprehensive benefit structures for all employees. And um, if you'll recall, I believe it was about a year ago, uh, locked in, which would be our consultant provider and plan administrator for all of our benefit plans, presented and shared that we are very comparable and we offer a robust benefit structure to all of our employees. Um, and very um, affordable knowing that over the last, I wanna say, Six out of the seven years, um, our um, district has been able to absorb the cost increases of benefit plans um, in our district while also enhancing opportunities and service opportunities. For example, we um, have increased opportunities of services to our employees in the area of medical and mental health supports through virtual options. A lot of our plan providers are extending out contracts to uh, make sure that we have employees that aren't waiting too long to receive services, uh, to name a few. Paired with that, we uh, currently do uh, provide 70% of our STDI short-term disability insurance for all employees at no additional cost to our employees, uh, which is comparable out there in the metro area. One thing that we want all of our employees to be aware of, and you'll soon be getting a communication out, or we'll give all of you a communication about this, is that we are working with Lockton to provide opportunities for employees to share feedback on our current benefit plan structure, not only in the area of medical, dental, vision, et cetera, but also in the area of staff wellness and self-care resources and supports. We know it's really important for our employees to know how to support themselves or their family members when personal needs arise, whether that is in the medical type field and or in the mental health and crisis supports and self-care. Um, supports. So we will be working with Locked In on that. Some of the information that you'll see would include what is most important in a benefit plan. For example, um, is a wider network more important to individuals or lower co-pays, just as an example. And Locked In will be implementing that and sharing results with us so that we can review that and find additional ways to enhance our benefit structure, partner in the community with various resources for our employees, and also, as much as possible, keep costs low. Thank you. And since Director Holtzman um, read some of the bullet points of the benefits, I also want to parallel that with the resolution 
in which we communicated the values that we heard from staff and our employees that we wanted to make sure the new compensation system reflected. So we really have three resolutions. We have the benefits resolution and the compensation resolution that always has been in place in terms of communicating to the staff the values that this board has heard from our employees and in turn directed staff to say, these are the values we wanna make sure are reflected in our compensation package and benefit package. And then we have the resolution that's the transition resolution that actually this tonight's action will reactivate. But let me just read very quickly some of the, the uh, values that we've communicated that the new compensation system should reflect that includes a predictable compensation schedule for all employee groups that acknowledges experience, longevity, knowledge and performance such as skills, professional growth, responsibility and collaboration and other areas as derived by employer input. A compensation system that is easily comparable to neighboring school districts. A compensation system that is developed after the opportunity for ample feedback and input from employees and regularly and effectively communicated to all staff. A compensation system that progressively moves towards a regionally competitive pay for all employees and a compensation system that reflects research and best practice for ensuring equity and employee satisfaction. And, and those are the things that Ms. Thompson has been working hard on for the past year and a half or two uh, to really make sure that those things are truly reflected in the new, stru the new structure um, that we are looking forward to implementing. So just wanted to also parallel and make sure everyone is clear in terms of what those values look like for the actual compensation structure. So. Any other questions for Ms. Thompson? Uh, Director Long? Again, I want to thank you for the great effort your department you know, does. People don't realize that you do not have that many staff and you have a lot of works that you are doing that people do not know of. For example, when we first start this process in 2018 after I was elected not too long after. We are facing the problems of arbitrary increase of teacher's pay due to the so-called pay for performance scam. The pay fees years that arbitrarily put a lot of our senior staff into a much lower salary compared with the new higher. And also the lack of equality paying system to make all of the employee at that time in the early 2018 have so much inequality. And, 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 and you have done an excellent job, you know, in doing that with very, very few staff. And we certainly don't want to go back to those years. But I just want to, I know that you, know, you are very humble and you, you know, your department does not talk about much about what you do. I think it is, it's good for you to let people know why it took you a couple years to reach this point. Because one thing I heard is in 2018, after I get elected, not, and we were told that we, we don't even have enough record for you to uh, compile and put people together. Can you just, just give an overview of what difficulty that you face and uh, how much effort that you did up to this point? Thank you, Director Lung. First of all, um, it is a team effort. And, and not only that of um, team HR, but also um, team finance and all the work of our principals in helping advocate for this work, all of our staff out there, it's all of our employees and this is our work together. And um, it is our why in HR. If we can serve and support and accomplish this amazing project, then we know that uh, we will have employees that feel valued and then they can best serve and support our students. So um, we're honored for that. Know that um, upon my first entry into HR, we did an assessment and we learned that we had some data to gather, um, transcript credit, years experience credit, and um, just 
layers of, of various practices that we found much opportunity to go in and um, reassess, regather, and build that data foundation so that we knew uh, what kind of structure, what kind of system that we needed to put in place. So um, a lot of learning and then moving forward and working with our employees. So we thank our employees for their patience and know that um, it is what we are most excited and grateful to be able to do to serve and support the system. Having been an EA4 myself, a substitute, a teacher, mm -hmm. um, and you know, just very grateful to give back to um, our system of employees. And I know that it feels like it's been a long time. We've had some uh, various challenges, but, but we are excited to be able to share um, and, and reshare because in the past we've shared previous schedules. We'll be able to bring uh, revised um, opportunities forward for people to share. We'll, we'll be engaging with our employees. Uh, whether that be with each site through our leaders or um, in department meetings with our employee council. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to see and understand all of the layers of work that have gone into it and, and what's coming forward with our goal of implementing in school year 22-23. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Director Chancha Shore. <laughs> with the I hot know mic. What's going on with my <laughs> microphone, but um, I have a comment. So when I came on to the board four years ago, at that time I had 40 years experience in education. Now I have 44. I had never seen anything like the compensation schedule that we lived in. And I hope, that I really just want to emphasize, again, what you're saying, what Director Lung was saying, the work that had to be done to get from point A to point Z was tremendous because it was so unpredictable with lack of clarity. And the people, that's who were buried in the minutia. So it takes time to dig all of that minutia out of the way, which could be used a different word, but I'm using <laughs> the word minutia, and move it out of the way so that people can be in the forefront again in Douglas County, and it can look like a compensation schedule. It takes that much time because of the mess it was. And I just want to reiterate that that happened very quickly to the people in our school district. So the people in our school district deserve this next step to continue to look at compensation and to look at it through fair eyes and in a way that says to our educators and the people in our system that it is important. We had that value for the last four years and probably a little bit before that. For four years, we've been talking about this. And now we're at a point where we have to say, because there have been distractors that also have happened, there's also been steps in the process. It hasn't stopped. Correct. And it takes this long because it was buried in minutia. So please remember that as we take steps forward. Thank you, Director Chancho Shore. And uh, whereas it took a chunk of years to get into this situation that we are now climbing out of, we are pleased to really, when you look at it, it feels like a long time, but less time to get to a whole new better place. Very good. Thank you, Director Chancho Shore. Any other comments before? I we'll, we'll want us to move us to a motion to approve the resolution. Motion to approve. Okay, the motion is to approve the resolution for authorizing one-time stipend and reactivating the resolution transitioning to a new employee compensation system. Is that correct, Director Lund? Yes. Let's make one, <clears throat> one uh, comment. Can we, let's, let's second it first and then I'll, I'll allow for comments. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Director Graziano, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, um, want to comment here uh, around this um, as a, f a father of uh, two uh, Doug Co graduates, uh, one who's um, first year in college and one who just started her first year um, full time work after graduating college. I think to me the, the it goes back to what uh, Assistant Superintendent Abner said earlier. When I think of my kids and I think of their experiences in the last few months here as they've both gone on to new journeys, both at college and, and employment, they've had multiple times where they've expressed to me remembrances and thankfulness for their teachers in Douglas County School District. 
And that to me is very meaningful. And to me, it just speaks to the foundation that our teachers and the district provides for our students. So for that, I'm very thankful. And I'm very thankful that for the teachers that have impacted my kids um, so meaningfully, and I'm you know eager to support this resolution. Thank you, Director Graziano. Other comments, Director Meek? So when COVID first hit, our district was faced with um, how to address the economic crisis that resulted from the shutdown. And we needed to cut about $30 million from our district managed schools because of the state shortfall. So we were forced to make some really difficult cuts and decisions at that point in time. And our employees helped us navigate that storm. Um, once the state budget rebounded, you know, we were able to invest back into our employees. Progress has been made and there's still work that must be done to improve our market competitiveness against our neighboring districts who have more resources due to local elections. So our employees continue to navigate this with us and we really appreciate all of that. Like I said earlier, our employees are the lifeblood of our organization. And I've looked at other local organizations in our county and actually the largest private employer gave a thousand dollar bonus right when COVID hit to their employees to help them through the, the fallout and all of the uncertainty and we were cutting because we were looking at, at significant budget cuts. That largest employer just announced they're giving a 5% pay increase to their employees. Um, every employer is doing everything they can to hold on to their employees and to thank them for their work and their commitment during the most challenging times that any employees have ever had to work in. So, I greatly appreciate that our district has kept a keen eye on our budget and is looking at creative ways to find valuable resources to invest into our employees and our students. And I, you know, to all of our employees, I really just wanna thank them for helping us continue to navigate the storm and really showing up each and every day to serve 64,000 students in our district. And for all of these reasons, I support this resolution. Thank you, Director Meek. Director Lung, I saw your hand. Well, I cannot uh, speak better than uh, Dr. Meek on um, these topics, um, but I just want to say thank you the employee last year during the difficult COVID year budget cut to stop with us. You are the hero of this school district to help us keep us competitive and get us good educations for our students as shown in the CMAS result and SAT and uh, the other matrix that uh, we can uh, cap. Without you, there's no Dallas County School District. And um, we know that to recruit and um, retain quality employee, um, Compensations is an important um, want, and um, inflation is high, and uh, it's very difficult to find good employees, and competition is stiff out there because of the lack of the workforce. So I recognize that, many of my peers recognize that, and um, you know we want just show a token of appreciation for your work and for you to continue to stay with this school district. And it also shows that we keep our promise that we will try our best to find the dollars that we need to make sure that you, our employee, is being taken care of. And um, some may ask why we include not only the teacher, but the other staff. But I can tell you that every single people that work at Dallas County School District deserve these ways. You have, may not see how hard payroll work. You may not see how hard IT people work. You may not see how hard a custodian or even a security officer out there, how hard do they work? They may not, they, they may not be directly working to teach our students, but the support service like them, like our lunch person, bus driver, custodian, they are all the essential part 
of this school district to make us a destination school district. Therefore, I think everybody should be uh, entitled to this increase. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lung, and thank you for that reminder again that this is for all employees. It's not, I mean, we often talk about teachers. Um, we certainly value our educators, but as you have pointed out, we value all our employees that keep the lights on and keep the district uh, operation moving. So thank you for that reminder. Any other comments, Director Hansen? I also just wanna say thank you. I, um, I know we're talking about money right now, but, um, my, my mother was a school teacher for 25 years and I can still remember sitting at her desk and she had thank you notes from students pinned up. And I remember asking her one time why, why she keeps these and she said, nobody goes into teaching for the money. This is why you go into teaching. It's to have an impact on these kids and a thank you from these kids means everything in the world. So. I just wanna take this opportunity for parents and on behalf of our students, just to say thank you. I, I see you working late at night, early in the morning on a Sunday afternoon. I just got a ping five minutes ago from one of my kids' teachers updating grades in Infinite Campus. <laughs> I see your giant smiles in the car line every morning. I see you after school getting kids safely to their cars, whether it's 110 degrees or whether it's snowing. <laughs> and you're always there and you're always smiling. I know you're wearing 100 different hats every single day right now and the next day showing up and doing it all differently. Um, as a community, as a, as a nation in March when parents were trying to fill your enormous shoes, you were touted as heroes and I just want to say thank you um, from me and from my family. You will always be our hero and I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to vote yes for this um, compensation um, bonus and to continue our work as a board to uh, update our compensation schedule. schedule. Very good. Thank you, Director Hansen. Director Holtzman? Um, there's not much left to be mm -hmm. said, but I do want to personally thank each and every one of our teachers and our leaders and our counselors and our security um, Everyone, all of our staff, um, from a board director's perspective, um, passing this resolution, this one-time spend, and also reactivating our compensation and benefits resolutions that we've had in place, um, helps us reach our board's goal of supporting, valuing, retaining, and celebrating our teachers and staff. And I, and I know that you know we, we wish we could do more, but I hope that this is something that will help you know that we are celebrating each of you um, as a board and as a system. But I think what you hear from us is this is also personal. You know, I, I look back to my own sons and their experience um, going preschool actually through 12th grade um, here in Douglas County and, and the, the teachers and the staff are what made their experience for them um, and what makes me want to serve this district. So, um, so I just want to say thank you and I also would like to vote in support of this. Very good. Certainly can't echo any further than just again stating what we started with at the beginning is that our employees are what make the difference for our students. And so this investment in our employees um, in turn sets our students up to thrive and be successful. And I would just reiterate, reiterate again that, you know, finding creative sources like selling land, that's the kind of work that this board does is to find those financial places to make this happen. And uh, I believe that the stars align tonight where we've had a historical moment of selling some land to convert it into dollars. And then in turn, we've been able to invest more dollars into our employees to say thank you, as well as to reassure them that the uh, compensation system will improve and will be ready to go for the 22-23 school year. So with that, the, there's been a, a motion and a second for the resolution. Any further discussion, questions, or comments? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Chancho Shore. Aye. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. And that.
passes unanimously. All right, moving on to Board of Education reports. Um, just a few announcements. You heard uh, one of our speakers come up and tell you that the Bridge program is doing a makeup in-person graduation um, on October 7th at 7 o'clock p.m. at Castleview High School. So if any of you would like to attend, I will, I will certainly be there. Um, again, I think it just shows, again, how responsive the system is because if you remember that speaker came and was quite distressed that he didn't have the experience of an in-person graduation, we connected him with the director of the Bridge Program. Um, and I just want to you know, celebrate Judy Jordan and all the staff of the Bridge Program who coordinated this and pulled this together uh, in response to his concern. And so the 2020 and the 2021 uh, graduation classes will indeed have their in-person moment at Castleview High School on October 7th, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, agenda planning is this Thursday at 10 o'clock. Also on this Thursday, as uh, Superintendent Wise shared, we do have the Dream Gala event um, at Wing Over the Rockies. And just to be clear that that's not the one up in Lowry, that is the one in Centennial. So, um, but I, and I don't know, Mr. Wise, if there's still opportunity for people to purchase tickets to go to the gala, but I, if there is, I wanted to give a kind of a public service announcement that if you're interested in that, that there's still capacity or, or do we know? We, uh, capacity and, and ordering has already happened, but we will build people in, so reach out and also the support of it. Uh, I do believe it is actually at Lowry, for what it's worth. No, no, they no? just came out and it's, it's at it Centennial. So. Perfect. perfect, perfect, I like being right ever so often. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, no, and that's, I had it in my calendar the same way, Mr. Weiss, and so I'm glad that they clarified, otherwise I'd be on I-70 looking for something. Okay, so then also next study session is on October, or next board meeting is October 12th. It is a study session, the focus is part two of academic excellence as well as our safe positive culture and climate goal with a special focus on social emotional learning and mental wellness. And then the final thing, Mr. Weiss and, I, and deputy superintendents, I just wanted to do a quick shout out. I have almost finished my circuit of visiting schools that have new principals that are just hired this year. And I just wanna applaud you guys, deputy superintendents, staff, oh my gosh, we have some amazing new leaders that are rocking it. And especially again, in the top trying times that we're in, uh, I just wanted to do a, I just wanted to shout out to the new leadership and your wise uh, selection process and decision making because we have some amazing leaders who have an incredible heart for students. So um, with that, I'll end my report, Director Holtzman. Yes, um, I wanted to use my time tonight to say a thank you um, to our entire community for holding up the history of our school district. Um, in particular to the Hilltop Social Club. Um, they invited and, and opened to the public um, the Hilltop Schoolhouse um, that celebrated its 100th anniversary, I believe it was just two weekends ago, um, so since our last board meeting. And I was really thrilled to get to attend that um, and meet the members of the Hilltop Social Club, some of them you know, um, have been caring for this for, for 50 years. Others, they have new members, so it's just a real community effort. Um, I was able to purchase or donate to receive a cookbook that I'm excited. I asked what the favorite recipe is, and, and they all had one, so I'm excited to try out this new pea salad recipe. But um, just really just wanted to say it made me think about um, the great history of our district. Um, our community cares about our students and has supported our students for, for so long and continues to do that. So I just wanted to say thanks to the Hilltop Social Club for taking care of that building for us and, and reminding us of our great history. Very good, thank you, Director Holtzman. And I just had an afterthought of as I was shouting out to our uh, principals, I wanna make sure that all our leaders are doing an amazing job, but I also wanna shout out to our directors of schools, because they certainly are part of that process of setting up that selection. So I wanna give accolades to our deputies and our superintendent, but also I know there's a lot of people that, uh, that go after looking for those candidates. So other director reports that need to be made. Director Meek. I just wanted to highlight last week, uh, Cimarron Middle School 
hosted several legislators from the state and they just did a phenomenal job. Like the word that I have in my head walking away was engagement. You know, we had legislators going into all of these different classrooms and to see the students who led these tours, you know, the level of engagement that was happening in the classroom was just amazing. And the way they were able to showcase the importance of climate and culture in our schools, it was a really powerful way for the legislators to start their day. I can say I, I stayed on this tour throughout the day and we were the best district. So I am <laughs> really happy to report that. And it was, it was pretty phenomenal. I know all of us have been in schools, but I think it certainly makes the world okay when you go into classrooms and you hang out with students and, and, and children. It's like, okay, the world is, is crazy out there, but good stuff is happening in our schools. So uh, applaud, uh, applause again to all our employees. Other director reports, Director Lung? Well, as your parent engagement um, for liaisons, I want to shout out to uh, the special act um, and parent engagement effort. Um, Cheryl and Nicole, as far as I remember, that has been never been done before of having this sip and talk. Um, just last week alone, we have three different types of uh, parent engagement for special act. Um, we have the one in uh, Castleville High School, um, have a panel, which almost all of our senior level um, administrator is there, superintendent wise, and two of the deputy superintendents. Just shows you how much we care about the special ed groups. And also we have a deluxe you know, uh, um, panel also um, on, um, on Wednesday morning. And then the next day, um, around lunchtime, we have another special ed engagement that is a sip and talk. So I, I myself see a huge improvement in the parent engagement effort for the special ed community. And also, not only that, we also address the mental health during the panel discussions also. So the district is moving in the right path and uh, doing so much better in terms of uh, engaging parents in those two areas. I mean, we did that also before, but I think it shows you know, a much, much more effort you know, under leaderships of uh, Superintendent Rice and, uh, and, uh, and the special ed um, um, leader you know, uh, uh, seat. Um, so I just want to thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Long. Other director reports, Director Graziano. Yeah. Uh, director Chancho Shore and myself um, attended the uh, Milbon Oversight Committee uh, meeting last week, right, last week. And um, so, we, you know, again, with, the, with that committee, um, covered a lot of the projects that are under, uh, underway, have been completed within the district. Also, you know, a good part of the conversation and, and where we uh, came out was around determining some ways we want to, you know, summarize and report back on the work that's been done. So I think we've got some follow up there between the district and, and the committee around the, the best mechanism to present that information. So um, that, that'll be work that, that's some follow up that we have in flight here in the next, you know, before the next meeting, I think hopefully we can have some conversations uh, via email. Some suggestions have been made, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. But again, the, with the intent that we want to be able to present that, you know, all of the information, all the things that have been done um, within the district due to the, uh, the bond money, um, present that back in a way um, that uh, can, can be reviewed and uh, show what's going on in the district fully. Very good. Thank you, Director Graziano and Director Tantra Shore. Any other director reports? Um, if, if, Mr. Wise, go ahead. Yeah, Super so just to follow up a little bit, I also want to echo, I want to, I want to give a, just a thank you for noticing and also give a shout out. Our Student Support Services uh, Department, Special Education, they've worked hard to not only engage, but reach out and be responsive. We've heard the same feedback from principals and schools uh, from the community. So I just want to continue to say that piece and also acknowledge I notice and the feedback that I receive. Uh, when it comes to the others, I, I wanna uh, make the board aware and others. Um, we do have our work towards literacy and reading and we have some opportunities uh, to take a look at some of our resources, our resources that are aligned with Read Act, our resources that are aligned with literacy, dyslexia, 
reading as a whole, because reading for all students is a key priority. Um, but we have our benchmark uh, presentation Wednesday, September 29th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Rocky Heights, and this will be, uh, there's more advertisement out there and, and showing, and then also McGraw-Hill, which is Wonders, uh, Thursday, September 30th, 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Rocky Heights. So we'll be sharing more of that, but it's also the continuation of providing the resources uh, for our teachers to be at their best, especially with a focus on, on literacy and reading, okay? And Mr. Wise, those sessions are remote, is that right? Or are they in person? Mr. Uh, Reynolds. They're, they're actually in both. Um, we have a YouTube channel that's recording it, but if folks wanna come in person, they are free to do so. All right. So this really, and I think we need to accentuate that this really fits our process for how we consider curriculum resources. We, get, we, we put them on display for the public to interact and look at and, and give us feedback uh, as we're looking at those resources. So sometimes people ask, how does resources get from point A to the classroom? And this is a perfect example, an invitation to be engaged and really see firsthand what these resources will offer. So. Thank you for that announcement. And that is also on our website as well as on our Facebook postings. So we've, we've uh, advertised that in, in a number of ways. All right, any other director reports? All right, seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion moved, made by Graziano, seconded by Holtzman. All those in favor say aye. 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 Have a good evening, everyone.